Good evening and welcome to the Monday, February 8th meeting of the Winchester Select Board. My name is Michael Betancourt. I serve as chair. Uh, joining me this evening are Vice Chair Susan Verdicchio, Select Board members Amy Shapiro and Mariano Golubov, uh, Town Manager Lisa Wong, uh, Beth Rudolph, also Town Engineer, Stacey Ward, our Comptroller, um, and uh, Patty Michalik from our office. Um, and uh, we'll be joined by other uh, staff throughout the evening as well. Um, didn't know if there are any members of the board that had any um, comments at the outset. Uh, feel free to jump in. Should I go ahead and do the land acknowledgement? Sure. Um, and uh, just a, a, a quick thank you to um, all of our DPW staff as well who um, have been hit with some snow lately and been doing a great job to uh, keep things moving. So um, thank you. And uh, any, if anybody else wants uh, to make a comment, um, jump in. Otherwise, Susan, you can jump in with the land acknowledgement. Okay. So as one step toward carrying out our equity and anti-racism initiative, we acknowledge that we are meeting on the ancestral homeland of the Massachusetts people who lived here for thousands of years before European colonists began arriving about 1630. In the 1600s, the Massachusetts were led by the Front Squaw of Missitec, who was called the Squaw Sachem by the colonists. And she led her people through epidemics, wars, and displacement. We acknowledge that the Winchester exists within a region where lands were taken under unjust and violent circumstances, causing a forced relocation that continues to have harmful effects on Native communities. As part of the town government of Winchester, we recognize our responsibility now to be good stewards of this land. And we acknowledge that Massachusetts, Wampanoag, and other indigenous people from across the country currently live in Winchester and throughout the state and contribute to our communities in myriad ways. Thanks, Susan. Um, just as a matter of notification, uh, right now, the next scheduled meeting we have is Monday, February 22nd. Uh, we'll be meeting a regular session at 7.30 p.m. Um, unless uh, things change. So we can... Um, move forward with the acceptance of donations as well. So that we, look, I move that we accept with gratitude a donation of $1,000 from the Cummings Foundation. Um, these are Make a Difference Dollars program to the Winchester Coalition for a Safer Community to be put toward the coalition's education programs. Second. All in favor, I'll take a roll call vote. Susan? Yes. Amy? Yes. Mariano? Yes. And yes, for me, motion carries unanimously, 4-0. And I move that we accept with gratitude donations in the total amount of $1,100 from Kristen and Mike Ross, Winchester Police Officers, Winchester Police Superior Officers Association, Winchester Police Association, and Winchester Police Fund Raising Committee for the Public Safety Memorial. Second. All in favor, I'll take a roll call vote. Susan? Yes. Amy? Yes. Mariano? Yes. And yes for me, the motion carries unanimously 4 to 0. So uh, also, uh, at this point, I'll take any matters from the audience. Um, if ever anyone is here for an item that is otherwise not listed on our agenda, uh, we will hear from you now. Um, if you are an attendee not in the um, panelist category, just uh, wave your hand. Um, and I'll call on you. Seeing none, we'll uh, jump into the um, a bit early for the hearing. Um, we'll jump jump into the uh, first item on our business agenda: the Lake Street Bridge. Beth and uh, Jay are here. How are you? Good. Nice to see you, Beth. You too. Thank you. Um, I have a really brief uh, PowerPoint presentation that I sent to Patty if she wants to put it up. Thank you. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So. Um, I'm here tonight just to kind of give the board a very quick update on two large construction projects we have um, happening over the next year or so. 
Uh, the first is the Squatton Street Bridge project. Um, very exciting. This is project eight of the town's flood mitigation program, one that we've been working on for a very long time. Uh, involves the reconstruction of the Squatton Street Bridge over the Abdrajona River to incre uh, increase the opening there and um, increase the capacity uh, for flow under the bridge. Uh, the project was bid last year and we were able to award it to Mass MAS Building and Bridge Incorporated. Um, again, pretty excited that we were able to, you know, um, have come in with a good price for that project. Uh, it's a large project, so it's always good to have a uh, successful bid. Um, work is expected to start this spring, and Squanton Street will be closed from June 15th to September 15th. Um, so that will be a, a big disruption to that area and to the town in general, uh, particularly given the proximity to the transfer station. Um, staff is meeting later this month internally to coordinate the uh, the impacts to police, fire, schools with the bridge closure, and we expect to hold a public meeting or a series of meetings um, in the early spring just to get um, input from residents uh, and get, try to you know do our best to um, work on the outreach for that closure so people are aware of that. Um, and we have tool under contract to help with the um, over overall project messaging. So. Um, Mike, do you want me to take questions on each one, or you want me to go through the Lake Street project next? Um, yeah, let's um, go through them, and then we'll take questions. Okay. Uh, next slide, please, Patty. Thank you. Um, so this next one is the Lake Street Bridge project right next to the DPW. Um, this is a, also a bridge replacement project due to the structural deficiencies that were found a couple years ago during a mass DOT bridge inspection. Uh, the project is currently in the permitting phase. Um, they're actually finishing up their Conservation Commission permitting, um, and then we have uh, permitting through the Army Corps of Engineers and the Chapter 91 license. Um, we expect the project to be ready to bid probably in late November, a little bit depending upon our permitting schedule. The Chapter 91 license in particular um, can take six to nine months, uh, more or less, so it's hard to kind of predict exactly once the permits are in hand, we will be bidding that project. Um, one of the things I think I, I just wanted to bring to the board's attention, we had discussed, um, you know, maybe a year or so ago about the options for that bridge project, whether we wanted to look at a full bridge closure or a staged, staged construction with one lane open. Um, our recommendation and Western Hampton's recommendation is for a full closure. Um, the estimated cost of that full closure is about $1.9 million, um, and the construction duration for that for that option would be 120 calendar days with the bridge being closed for half of that or being closed for 60 days. Weston Sampson did look at that staged construction uh, with one lane open. That's obviously um, a lot harder for the, for the uh, contractor to construct that. It's a very small bridge, very small area to work in. Um, they estimated that option would increase the cost to $1.9 million. Um, and extend the construction duration to 220 calendar days. <clears throat> it'd also be challenging because we'd have to set up a temporary traffic signal in that area to, um, you know, to have the cars go through. So um, I think again, our recommendation is for the full closure. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Uh, any questions from uh, anyone on uh, either project? Yeah. Um Beth, if we go back to uh, Swanton, is there an option for staged construction there? That that decision was made several years ago, I think, okay. by the board to move forward with the full closure. Um, the other question here is, can we start two weeks early and end two? Can we go June first to September first? Um, so we have a in water work restriction as part of our permits, which is the June fifteenth deadline, and we said June fifteenth to September was the was in the contract documents that we gave um, when we did the project. So I think we're limited to that date at this point. Okay. Uh, I mean, the reason is, you know, in September, we're hopefully going to have um, the schools open full time. So everybody will be going to school in each school day, whereas in June, um, it is less than half given the hybrid remote model. Right. So. right yeah. And unfortunately, just the way the state permits these projects with the in-water restrictions due to the herring um, yeah. migration, we're limited to that to start. Okay. 
So, Beth, I had a question on uh, Lake Street about sure. the, the total closure. I, I know some people are concerned about that. Um, I think I someone mentioned that there might be a footpath in the Yeah, works. so that's one of the things I should have mentioned, and I apologize. Um, that's one of the things we're working on right now. Um, so the project, we, we currently have a, a funding appropriation of $1.5 million, so we are just at the tippity top of our budget. Um, and adding a pedestrian bridge, which is something that we've looked at, would put us over budget. Um, mm -hmm. So we're currently evaluating ways um, that we also have sort of a cost on knowing this like national grid work out there to like do gassing over the over the road. So we're, we need to bring some clarity to that piece. Mm -hmm. um, and we are evaluating either a temporary um, pedestrian bridge on the DPW side or just looking at um, improving a footpath along the bikeway up to the DPW crossing and then bringing folks um, down the other side of the river on some town owned land. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that is something that we're still working on right now. Currently in place. Thank you for looking into that. Sure. Yeah, no, we agree. It's uh you know it's a it's a important pedestrian path. We're doing what we can. I just have one quick question. Um, so if we, for the Lake Street Bridge, if we look to bid in no at the end of November, do you have any sense of when the project might start and end, or the, the time? So I don't right now, actually. And um, you know, I I actually might follow up on this in this during our time today. But I believe we may be subject to the same um, in water work restrictions in the spring. So it's possible that we may try to. Do some of this work over the winter, uh, and we'll have to wait and see what shakes out with permitting. Um, I'm hopeful that maybe we'll be able to bid this before November because I'd really like to get it started as soon as possible, so we don't run into that in water restriction. Um, but I'm just we're just not far enough along to be able to say for sure. Okay, thanks. Sure. Yep. And the Lake Street Bridge project was, you know, no matter how much we try to align all of our uh, large construction projects that, you know, have street closures, it, it kind of um, uh, surprised us a bit and uh, ended up kind of forcing us to address it a little bit more narrowly um, than we, you know, we would have we would have liked. So uh, it, you know, it's something the state has recommended that we jump on. So um, yep. that's why we're doing it seemingly at, at a difficult time um, and it's because of the uh, safety issue. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Any other uh, questions or comments? Okay, I didn't know if you have anything uh, to add there. Yeah, no, uh, uh, it's going to be a busy summer. Uh, as we've been talking, uh, this will be the busiest uh, you know, some uh, for utility projects, uh, we are concerned about trying to get the people crossed uh, because of uh, the closure. And I think we do have a plan that, like Beth said, that we can divert them through the DPW and get them up to Main Street. Okay, that's good. Uh, if there are no questions, then um, we'll move on to uh, the next agenda item. I know, um, Jay, you're also here for the Morocco Boiler um, discussion. Uh, yeah, and uh, Pete Lawson should be on, too, I and, think. And Pete, too, so we'll, we'll bring Pete in, too, so we can uh, get moving on that. So we'll uh, try to get back into some order uh, soon, so we'll, we'll jump on the uh, Morocco Boiler uh, and then uh, head to the... Uh, the hearing that is posted uh, for the Eversource Grant allocation. Hey, hey Pete, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, good. So um, you wanted yeah. to provide an update on the uh, boilers at Morocco? Sure, so I'll, yes. I'll start off, Dan and Pete, I'll start off, you know, my, uh, this is a, a replacement of three boilers uh, at Morocco School. They're 10 years old. Uh, five years uh, we've had problems. Uh, the problems that we've had uh, have been some uh, heating failures. We've closed the school a, a couple of times. And also uh, we've had some uh, carbon monoxide alarms 
where we had to evacuate the school. Um, when we did have problems with the boilers, uh, and I'll let Pete talk about you know what he found and what we plan on doing. Um, the company's out of Canada, so when a boiler goes down, uh, it takes forever, especially with the pandemic uh, situation going on. It even takes longer to get uh, parts. So usually, uh, you know, when one boiler's down, we still have two, and at one point, I think we lost two. Uh, boiler. So, to, like I said, to get the parts, uh, they ship them from Canada. It, it takes a while. Um, so Pete started researching our uh, boilers that, uh, you know, a similar to this. Uh, Pete, why don't you take over and talk about uh, the boilers that we like to uh, call? So, I, I'm happy to jump in. Just a quick rundown in 2010 the town researched uh, the hi a high efficiency uh, total heat replacement project for Morocco. They studied different uh, options to get rid of the old steam system and came up uh, with this uh, forced hot water full condensed boiler system. Uh, back then, uh, we were just new. Everybody was new into these high efficiency boilers, and there wasn't a big track record for a lot of them. These were great for five years and then all of a sudden after five years it was something different would happen and we did have success with the local rep for the boilers assisting us through problems and then it would be another problem and it, over the last five years uh, these problems keep popping up the type of boiler does not allow for good alarming that we get early warning on a lot of things so that we spend a lot of time uh, doing extra types of physical checks, monitoring uh, through the computer program. And then recently this, uh, these issues with carbon monoxide, which are very scary, uh, just started arising. Um, the boilers themselves, I researched some uh, good boilers that are pretty well proven. It would be a uh, relatively good fit for the piping arrangement. Uh, we've proposed that. We've worked with our one of our uh, reliable mechanical engineers to come up with a cost proposal for design and replacement of these three boilers. As Jay has said, I've had a terrible time getting specific parts lately. Uh, we do keep a stack of different uh, parts on the shelf when we when we can buy what we our, our regular routine things that go. But when something out of the ordinary goes, it's it's really getting difficult to uh, do it quickly. Thanks, Pete and Jay. Um, we also Thanks. received a. Um, a memo from uh, Jim Johnson, the chair of the Capital Planning Committee, um, last week um, suggesting that uh, maybe we in investigate uh, town council or special council um, kind of reviewing uh, any cost recovery for these boilers. Um, you know, when we invest this much in um, a, a capital project, um, especially for the schools, uh, we expect it to last a long time and um, where they started failing after five years, I mean, that's a pretty big expense for us to um, just uh, move on from. And I, I don't know if it's uh, something that the board would uh, entertain um, discussions on. I mean, uh, we've had different issues over the years where we've kind of pursued some redress if there's been roof installation that's failed or other systems. Um, and uh, often we'll, we'll appoint council uh, or have town council uh, pursue uh, at least a legal evaluation of our of our options, um, including warranties and whatnot. Um, so um, I don't know if that, for, I guess it's a question for the board, if that's something that we would look to engage in at this time. I think that's a great, I think that's a good idea. I mean, I think if you buy a bunk car, I think there's lemon laws to protect you. And this is like, there, I think the warranty, I don't know, Jay and, you obviously know more about that, but if there's a warranty that exists somewhere that we're, you know, we could we could call on, or um, I think also just having uh, 
um, worthwhile before we spend all of the money to. Well, I can. They were they were a uh, five year uh, parts and equipment warranty and one year uh, workmanship warranty, which is pretty much standard. Uh, they are eleven years old now, so I, I invite any kind of review that you guys want to do on it. I just don't know uh, how far that would go, but I'm right there to provide any information. Well. Is Oh, <laughs> sorry. Oh. That's all right. It's um. <laughs> Pete so, has, I mean, I think I we should buy dogs for a second, but I mean, we should pursue, you know, whatever we can to recover costs. But um, at the same time, you know, that doesn't preclude us from actually fixing the issue, right? So that the Morocco school has heating, so um, or reliable heating without. Uh, the threat of carbon monoxide. So I think we should do both, right? We should uh, look at the boiler replacement and separately pursue legal action if there is any on the existing boiler. My my question is, um, is the replacement included in the $350,000 um, that was detailed in our packet for Morocco boiler replacement? Is that what we're talking about here? Yes. This, this this would be part of the um, the override. Um, okay. So we, we included it as part of the project. And um, I know um, when we looked, uh, we took a tour uh, last January um, of Morocco, we kind of had identified this as an issue and um, and it's, it's really uh, only gotten progressively worse. So um, as you said, Mariano, it's a, it's a kind of a imminent safety issue and we don't have a good solution besides replacement. So. Um, hopefully this will um, be the you know uh, best way for us to solve it are, are we able to uh, replace it with a um, uh, what is it called a ground linked uh, heat pump uh, one that doesn't use uh, fossil fuels uh, that would be a, a much larger engineering job this supplies the hot water and throughout the whole Morocco school. It's a good question for the engineers. I think that would be uh, a, a bigger, bigger project than replacing the full condensing boilers that are there, which are pretty, pretty efficient natural gas burners. So the, uh, the condensing boilers we have there right now, are they combination? So they're both hot water and heating? Uh, they're just they're just heating hot water okay so heating and hot water okay so we would need a, a a ground to ground to water heat pump not a ground to air heat pump then um, which i don't know if it exists but i know we have climate action uh people here uh, attending tonight so uh, not to put anybody there on the spot but um there might be something to look into it ground source heat pump there's uh ruth so um, I, I'm just, I, I think, you know, we should look into that if, if that would be possible. My only information about, uh, ground source heat pumps is that they work well with a, uh, hot water radiant system, but they don't deliver a warm enough temperature for, uh, something where the, uh, main, main source is air over the, over the coil, but it's definitely something that could be looked at. So I would just throw in, I also support, you know, at least investigating whatever legal recourse we might have, you know, on some kind of warranty or beyond the warranty, you know, it's, it was a huge expense for, you know, 10 years. So we should look into that. Okay. Um, thanks, Susan. And we'll um, also, uh, Pete uh, and Jay, uh, look into any ground source heat pump or uh, geothermal options um, there. Um, I know that we kind of asked you to um, get something to kind of solve things as fast as possible um, and uh, as inexpensively as possible in consideration to the, uh, the override you know, cost that we're looking for. But um, 
but it might uh, it might be worthwhile, and there may be some uh, other incentives as well. Maybe if we connect with Susan McPhee um, as well, um, the town's energy coordinator um, on that too. Maybe there's there's some ideas and solutions. Sure. Great. Um, okay, so we'll um, reach out to um, council um, to review our options there um, and uh, move forward. Uh, was there anything else, Pete or Jay, that um, the two of you had on the agenda? No, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chen. No. Thank you. I wanted to make sure I got you out of here because I know that there's been uh, uh, a few hours of sleep <laughs> over the past several days, so we, we, we appreciate all your work. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. The, the employees and staff have uh, been uh, tremendous, been working really hard. We've got uh, potentially three more storms coming this week. It, it's good job security for you, though. It is. It is. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks. thanks, guys. Hi, right, everyone. Take care. Bye -bye. Um, we'll move on to uh, item D on our agenda, and then we'll return um, uh, to the top after that. So I'll open the hearing for the Eversource Granite location. Uh, Park first uh, school, the pole on uh, Everson Road. Uh, I think uh, uh, Beth, if you want to lead us off, and then Ms. Duffy is here from Eversource as well. Sure, thank you. So this is actually um, part two of the last ground location, which was for the conduit. Uh, Eversource has determined that they need to install a pole on at the corner of um, Samoset and Emerson between uh, number 33 Emerson and number 48 Samoset. If you're familiar with the area, there's a stop sign at that corner and the pool we located approximately where that stop sign is. Um, DPW and engineering have reviewed it and have no concerns. Uh, it's important to move this uh, forward so that we can finish the elevator project at the Carpenter School. Thank you. Um. Ms. Duffy, I didn't know if there's anything else that you wanted to add uh, to I, that yes, I had talked to the owner at 33 um, Emerson, and he is all set. There will be no outage, and he was worried about the grassy area being put back to its original condition, and we will do that for him. Okay. Um, okay, are there any uh, members of the audience that have any questions? Uh, for town engineer Beth Rudolph or Jacqueline Duffy from Eversource. Um, just raise your hand and uh, we'll recognize you. Okay, seeing none, um, I'll close the public hearing uh, and see if there are any uh, questions or comments from members of the select board. I just had a quick question. Um, I think it's pretty clear, but I just wanted to be sure. This is not a temporary pole while the elevator is being installed. This is permanent, uh, so that permanent, you can run yeah. the elevator. Correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'm not seeing other questions. Um, so. Um, take a motion to approve the grant of location request from Eversource. I move that we approve a grant of location to Eversource um, to install a new poll proposed number 341-11JO-ES located at the corner of Emerson and Samoset Roads. These improvements are necessary to provide underground electrical service to the Parker School for the ongoing elevator project. Second. Amy? Yes. Mariano? Yes. And yes for me. The motion carries unanimously, four to zero. Um, thank thank you. you very much. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank uh, you. Stuffy, thank you. Beth, and you're, you're all set, right? I'm all set. I think okay. so. All thank right. Good night, much. everybody. Thank you. Next item on our agenda, um, we'll move to the um, Griffin Museum and the Cultural Council District Floorville uh, fence. I think um, that. Uh, Ms. Tognarelli is here. Um, hi, Paula, how are you? Good, how are you, Mr. Chairman? Thank you for hearing us tonight. Yes, thank you very much uh, for your continued work with this uh, great project, and how can we help you? Well, we'd like to bring it back, and um, 
you know, last year I think was quite a success. The public um, needed it, I think, and, and uh, it was a, a dog send, I think. Um, we learned a lot from it. Um, you know, one thing there was a, a tiny bit of um, vandalism that the public works department uh, came to our rescue. Uh, we learned that a tremendous breeze comes off of uh, the Aberjona and Downshore Road. So um, our proposal is to move uh, some of the installations um, up the street more so that they're not affected. Uh, we've uh, petitioned the um, the people who are Photoville to uh, make some modifications to their um, assembly of the units. Uh, we're figuring that it will be around the same amount um, of, of units. Um, Mary McKenna, who is the chair of the um, Winchester Cultural District, um, loves uh, how we positioned them last year, but she also has expressed some interest in making it so that it's more about place. I know that the town put some benches, uh, tabletop benches around for people to sit, which is great because it makes it part of um, a, a destination or a place for people. Um, so we might consider um, moving some of the installations to make them look more intentional, um, uh, you know, moving um, so it may be contiguous, maybe bringing something more to the center of the town uh, to make those businesses um, involved more. Um, we want to this year make it more uh, collaborative with other organizations, keeping to the plan of being safe. Uh, like we're thinking of adding um, stations for QR codes so that we could um, have, uh, say, the, the music school would um, pick out music that people could be playing on their iPhones with this QR code and, and then be looking at the installations um, maybe some more um, artist information, making it more proactive for the, uh, the guests. Um, we're, we were thinking this year of perhaps uh, including a few um, other mediums in the fence area, but um, Mary McKenna would probably be the one to speak to that. If um, Mary, if you're here, would you do that? Come on, Paula. You're on, okay. Yeah. Tell me when you want me to jump in, it's fine. Go right ahead, Mary. <laughs> okay. um, hi, everybody. It's been a while. It's good to see everyone. Um, and we are, um, to expand a little bit upon what uh, Paul was talking about, we're looking at the opportunity to create uh, places around town and maybe break apart the X units a little bit so that um, they're mo more like an, an outdoor room, an outdoor place that you would arrive at and maybe work with the picnic benches that were great last year. Everybody loved them. Um, also, we're thinking um, Porch Fest, um, we're hoping will come back and can do their work this, this spring. And they had planned to play at our opening uh, event. And we want to engage with the farmer's market more and maybe get some um, much more music and performance. And if budget allows, our dream is to have a laser show, but uh, it's, it's all about money when you have these events. Uh, and so we're really starting to introduce a little more sculpture in with the photography, which is gonna make the festival um, much more exciting. Fantastic, thank you, Mary. Um, any questions or comments from members of the board? Thanks, guys. I mean, this sounds wonderful, and I, it's really intriguing how you're seeking to kind of increase it and make it more multimedia um, and coordinate with the picnic tables. I mean, it just it sounds great. Oh, good. Good. There, um, <clears throat> you know, last year, and it's really not my style to censor, you might know that there was some issues um, regarding one piece of work that was on town property. It was about a southern city and it featured um, <clears throat> people of color and there were some complaints but 
the town, town manager, Lisa, handled the uh, situation perfectly. Um, you know, I, I will be, not that I wasn't alert, but I'll be vigilant to look at anything that um, would go on um, town hall property. Great. Thank, thank you, Paula. And uh, thank you, Lisa, for handling that as well. And um, I would hope that, uh, you know, anything that is of artistic value, you know, wouldn't be um, limited. Um, certainly town hall is um, as much uh, a part of town um, as, uh, as anywhere. So um, uh, I uh, hope you wouldn't uh, steer away from anything um, oh, for that no, reason. So. Not my style. <laughs> I, think it, I think it was misunderstood. Yeah. 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 Well, it's helpful. Job. It's helpful to, to have those conversations. So it's good. So thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Paula. Yeah. Uh, so we'll take a, a motion um, to uh, approve the uh, fence for another year. Oh, I think you're muted, Susan. I don't think we can hear you. All right. So Sorry about that. Move that we approve the Griffin Museum, Winchester Cultural Council, and Cultural District um, request to run the Photoville fence installation again this year. Second. All in favor, I'll take a roll call vote. Susan? Yes. Amy? Yes. Mariana? Yes. And yes, for me, the motion carries unanimously four to zero. Uh, thank you so much, Paula, uh, and to Mary and for the work of the Culture Council and um, Griffin as well. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you. Take care. Um, next uh, on our agenda, we will uh, go through the uh, comptroller's report. If Stacy Ward is here. Um, Hey, Stacy, how are you? Hey, how are you guys? Good to see you. Um, I don't want to spend too much time, too much of your time on the control report. It looks as though um, we're in decent shape so far. I'm curious, like I wrote in my memo, to see how the motor vehicle excise is going to turn out. We'll find out probably within the next couple of weeks to see um, if it dropped 50%, if it dropped 10%, but um, that's the biggest local receipt and the biggest piece of, of um, that revenue that um, would be very interesting because that's the one that I think will have the biggest impact or COVID would have the biggest impact on. Um, so the real estate looks good. It's pretty much in line with what we expect at this time. Um, I mentioned that all of the budgets are updated based on the Department of Revenue's tax certification. So um, if you don't know, uh, the DOR certifies our revenues as of June 3rd, um, as of uh, December, usually the first week in December, we pull all of our budget information together from Springtown meeting and fall town meeting. We set the tax rate and they basically stamp what our revenues are going to be, what our, our estimated revenue is going to be for the general fund, the water sewer and the recreation department. So any revenues that might come in after the fact that we didn't budget for, we can't actually spend. We just have to let it go to the um, to fund balance. But um, I just wanted to point that out because the revenue seems to change at fall town meeting, we change it. And then when we do the recap, we change it a bit to uh, once we find out what the new growth actually is. And um, that usually ends up changing our local receipts up a bit. But this year we had a million dollars that um, we had estimated really low for the state receipts just to be conservative. So that million dollars, we were able to be extra conservative with our local receipts because we just don't know what to expect um, for the motor vehicle, for penalties and interest, all sorts of different buckets of money that um, we're not so sure how they're gonna come in. Um, they look okay compared to where we are last year. Um, but like I said, we'll know the biggest hit in the next uh, probably a couple of weeks. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm still working on the CARES FEMA um, reconciliation. So there might be some costs that are in the reports now that I'm gonna move. I still am expecting journal entries from the school department for costs that they incurred from September through December. They're still going through all of their records to make sure that we charge the CARES fund for what they wanted to charge. They were given 1.2 million of the $2 million um, allocation. 
in all the other departments, I'm still working with to make sure that I have what they want to move out of their operating budgets. The biggest issue is that FEMA decided to change what was eligible um, in the middle of it all. So what we had anticipated when we sent in our requests for the CARES money, that um, FEMA would cover 75% of a bucket of money, and now they're not going to cover it. I think we anticipated about $180,000 or so from FEMA, and they're giving us like 11000 But Rick is still working out some of those details, and hopefully he'll get that a, a little bit higher. But um, what we were hoping that FEMA would cover, they're not going to cover anymore. Um, but basically, all of the fee, all of the CARES money has been spoken for, so there's really not a lot of room for any new things that we want to charge the CARES fund that we're going to have to hit our budgets going forward. Um, there might be the odd five grand here and there that we thought we were going to spend, but we didn't spend maybe from the school or after going through some of the DPW details. But um, hopefully, I'll have that all worked out by the next reporting deadline, which is March 5th. So I, I will report to you that probably the next time I come to you with maybe some more solid information. Uh, let's see. Unemployment. Um, speaking of more solid information, I protested. Mm -hmm did everything that hit our bills that I didn't think was fair, whether it was fraudulent or whether it was someone who worked for us full time, but they're not eligible for unemployment if they have a full time job, even if they lose their part time job. So some of the things that unemployment approved, it was sort of approving on the fly without getting all the details. So unfortunately, we won't get that money back unless they collect it back from the employee. I'm not so sure how strict they're going to be and why we're going to have to eat it and not the state, but maybe that will change. Um, but the, um, the credits are still coming in. Hopefully in January, we'll get a big bill that has a giant credit on there, but I think they're gonna come in slowly because they're taking their time to look through all these fraudulent claims. Um, let's see. Uh, the water and sewer fund, um, hopefully they're gonna exceed their revenue targets for this year. Um, with the fee that was added and the 12% increase, it has actually given us a little bit of a buffer. I'm not going to say that the buffer is going to like solve all the water and sewer budget problems. I think for this year, it's going to help replenish the losses from last year because we got we got down to $400,000 of retained earnings, which is the lowest expense since I've been here, just because of that one horrible dry, um, wet year in 2020. Um, so I think this will sort of rebuild where we should be if we had a normal year. Um, but we, we, with consumption, the actual numbers are a lot higher than this time last year. So that's good news. And um, I think Mark Abrahams is in um, under contract with Jay to go over some of the future out years and to see where and if we have to keep increasing the rates. I think there is still a need and there's still a need to discuss the, the um, infamous stormwater fee. So I don't know if that's something that's on the agenda for the spring town meeting or if that's been discussed at all since the last town meeting. Um, recreation is still um, struggling through the pandemic, but I think um, I think they're heading in the right direction at least. It seems like both Nick and Jim are, are really um, enthusiastic and they're looking for new ways and are, and are being very creative with what they're doing over at the rec department. We had a, another committee discussion about how we can make their fund structure work with their operations a little bit better. We thought about um, possibly um, instituting a chapter 44, section 53E and a half revolving fund. And there are pros and cons, but we're still sort of kicking around the details and getting some feedback from the DOR and the logistics about how we should operate it. So I'm sure that'll be coming to your desk or your table, your Zoom meeting um, in the future. So um, just a couple of things to think about. Um, does anybody have any questions about December numbers? Oh, one thing I want to make, um, make clear, I might send a revised version. I found out that the Finance Committee voted a reserve fund transfer for $51,000 in December that I just found out about it yesterday. So um, I, it's not in the report. In one of the pages, I sum up all the reserve fund transfers over the last few years, and you won't see that transfer in there. I wasn't aware of it until yesterday. <clears throat> so I'll do, um, I'll do a new page. I'll, I'll replace that page, and I'll replace the page in the general fund expenditures that, it, that would affect too, just so you have it up to date. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, Stacy, a question on uh, water and sewer. Um, yeah. If we were 
as a board to establish a policy on retained earnings as a percentage of um, either operating expenses or revenue, either one. Um, I'd be interested to see what percentage either you or Abraham's group recommends uh, that we set that policy to, because I, I think it would make sense to have such a policy, let's say 10 to 15% or whatever it is, right? And then we can go to town meeting, um, fall town meeting, and say, this is, you know, our policy is this, and this is what we, this is what we predict it's going to, this is what we project it's going to be. So we either need to raise rates or lower rates to keep returning earnings within that percentage. Yeah, I would definitely go on the higher side. I know our general fund reserve is between six and 10, but with water and sewer, where you're so dependent on consumption, granted that service fee certainly helps build a base of revenue when we don't have consumption, but it's certainly not gonna be enough if we do have a couple bad years. Um, so it would, I'm assuming Mark Abrahams would say it should be closer to the 20% range, but I'm not so sure how realistic that is, but I would say definitely over the 10, even into 15s, if it's feasible for us, for sure. And part of it uh, as well for us is to um, come up with a, um, uh, a system that works for the long term that um, with a stormwater fee that kind of balances a little bit more um, equity into, you know, our, our charges as well. So we've, um, I know that you mentioned that. So we're um, not taking it up uh, in spring uh, at the town meeting here, but it's certainly something that we've kind of committed to like evaluate uh, long term. Because I think there were, you know, a lot of residents that had a little sticker shock with their water bills this year, and, uh, and especially when you do um, look at that that fee, um, we increased that quite a bit to kind of bridge a gap that, as you mentioned, was the result of um, really low retained earnings. Um, you know, we're uh, vulnerable to uh, you know weather conditions and um, um, rain and drought, just like anything else. Yeah, at least facing having that service fee, you can pay for some of the fixed costs that um, you don't necessarily have to pay if your usage is down. But um, it is it is tricky. Um, it's hard to say we want a 20 percent reserve in a fund because that's 20 percent of I think their budget's 10 million. So that's a lot of money, but it will cover um, the years that it just usage tanks and with all the new and improve ways to save money on your um, save on usage and um, just here with the sprinklers. And um, I know that in Medford, we have a different sprinkler rate. So I don't know if you do that in Winchester where you pay just the water piece for um, sprinkler or it's water and sewer. I can't remember. Anyone know that? I don't, I don't think we have, I think if you, you can get a, a special meter, just- Oh, okay. You know, and very no, it's not actually, um, the sprinklers are, you can get a separate um, meter, but you still have to pay water and sewer. Oh, you pay both pieces, just, okay, yeah. yeah. So I wasn't yeah. sure if there'd be any pressure in the future to go with like a sprinkler rate to then save that piece of it. But um, that's all, those are all things to think about. <clears throat> yeah, I was just gonna say that this, I think this last time we presented it to town meeting, we sort of promise people that we would talk about this every year, you know, and really give them a, a chance to understand how the, how the whole thing works and, and what has changed, you know, with the new fee structure, not really the new fee structure, but the new, you know, increased fees and, and then. Oh, with the um, stormwater storm. and the DEP and the MS4 permitting, that piece of it? No, just to, just to talk about what we're doing, because we haven't really added a, a stormwater fee. And I would also support, um, talking about a stormwater fee again, I think people kind of could wrap their heads around the basics of it. And I think might be might now be understanding or might understand better why it would be like more equitable, you know, it would be tied to stormwater, um, I don't know, production or, you know, runoff from each, mm -hmm. you know, property. So yeah, we should definitely um, talk about and I, I thought, don't we have to set the water rates? When do we set the water rates? Town meeting has to approve any increases. Sorry, I, we, I should have said town meeting, but when is that? Spring or fall? Um, it doesn't necessarily matter when you do it, but oh, if okay. you want it to happen in the next fiscal year, you would do it at the spring. 
because I, I, we would, we should get um, Abrams to come in and, and explain things to us because I thought that was sort of the plan. Yeah, I think in their last analysis, they had a rate increase for FY22. Yeah. Um, but I don't know what's happened since uh, this time last year, probably <laughs> the last yeah. time I've talked to them. Well, around town meeting, I guess town meeting was much later last year, but. Um, That's true too, okay. Yeah, well, I, I think we have the benefit of knowing that um, we really did have a very high, you know, revenue uh, period of time over the summer, right? So it's, it, it's you know, um, you're kind of going from year to year if you're going to push off an increase uh, to say, well, we'll cross our fingers and hope we get the same revenue next, you know, uh, summer, at least the, the period into the fall as well. So um, it's always, I, I think what happened over the years as well is that we held off those, um, those re regular and incremental increases for such a long period of time and just kind of crossed our fingers and hope that it worked out. And it, and it did for really almost 10 years. Um, but it, it really just made the, the gap larger and it made the, the increase seem more severe when we, when we had to make it, um, last year. So. Yeah. If you do like 3%, like just gradually, yeah. um, everyone would not that they want to get used to a 3%, but it's sort of like expected. <clears throat> right. Any other questions for, um, Stacey or comments? Stacey, I'm, I might have missed this. New growth came in at 1.02, is that right? Yeah, it was over a million. The exact amount, I can tell you. Oh, that's fine. Uh, okay. <laughs> but um, are we seeing, I don't know if this is a question for you or for town manager, but um, are we seeing a slowdown or not on construction permits? From what I've heard, there's no slowdown. There's actually, there's, there's been a lot, but new growth is usually based upon the beginning of the calendar year. So I think all the information that new growth is calculated on would be as of right now and not like what's happening in this year. So I think last year was probably surprisingly a, a, a big year, but Lisa might have talked to um, Dan and or Al about it recently with some budget projections. So I'll leave that okay. to Lisa. Yeah, I'll just say that we're being very conservative in that amount in the budget that I'll show you later on today. We're I think still at 800,000 for revenue. Okay. You're yeah, on from mute, what, Mike. From what I've heard about the building permits, just like the in the activity is that, oh, it's going strong, but looking at the revenue collected in December last year compared to this year, it is down like $100,000. Whether there's some timing difference and posting differences, that's another thing I can look into, but it, it is down a little bit, but not as much as it possibly could have been with what's been happening. Great, thanks, Stacey. Any other questions or comments? All right, thanks, Stacey. Um, we're gonna uh, jump to the budget discussion a little bit later, so feel free to stick around. I just um, we're, got a little bit behind as usual and uh, just want to try to move through uh, as much as we can while we've got uh, some folks here that have been waiting for us. Um, thanks, Stacey. Um, so next we'll uh, move on to uh, business item uh, for the uh, outdoor dining uh, application. And uh, I think Brian Zichelli, our town planner is here as well. Hey, Brian, how are you? Good evening, everyone. Hey. Um, thanks for uh, bouncing around between meetings and uh, being here. We appreciate it. Um, so uh, at, we began um, last year uh, a lot more uh, outdoor dining, kind of picked up over, um, over a period of time. And I think there's an interest. I think most of the restaurants would you know, put tables and heaters out right now uh, if they could. And so, uh, you know, looking forward to uh, a robust spring, I think there's been um, kind of the question of uh, what the process is and um, ultimately uh, how soon we can make it happen. Sure, so um, that we've been developing this outdoor dining and retail application. Um, the goal is for that application window to go out in, in uh, by the end of the week. 
and then it would be up essentially for three weeks. So we would have this application window of three weeks from something like February 12th to March 5th, um, leading up to a outdoor dining season that would begin on April 1st. Um, uh, as, as you know, the cha uh, chair, um, there, has been, there have been a several restaurants that are really interested in trying to get out for that St. Patrick's Day um, uh, for that specific, I'm not sure what day of the week it is this year, um, but they, you know, weather dependent, they're trying to, they're trying to do that. Um, and there's certainly some, uh, reticent, uh, reticence by the, by the town safety wise for, you know, plowing and, and, and that type of thing. The question is whether we potentially close off that street for, for St. Patrick's day or not. So that, that, that's kind of an aside to the outdoor dining application in terms of when we would actually go. The, the plan right now is still April 1st, um, with rec that is a recommended by DPW simply based upon on fighting snow. Um, so the question really for us is, are we going to entertain some type of St. Patrick's Day, a day or two, something like that, I would imagine obviously would be weather dependent. Um, but the, the outdoor dining application has been, um, it's still, I believe there's a few more recommendations that we wanted to, to hear from. Um, I know Lisa had one recommendation about an additional committee, which I, which I totally agree with. Um, but out, um, outside of that, um, I could certainly bring up the application if you wanted to review it, or I don't, I don't know if you guys had questions, um, but you might, maybe we could start off with, um, with uh, the recommendation from Lisa. I know um, I don't have any recommendations. I helped develop it with, with, um, with, with other uh, staff. So um, this is kind of a, a first crack at the revamp from, from last year. Great, thanks, Brian. Lisa, um, what do you think about this one? So I, I think we should highlight the differences between uh, last year and this year. So um, last year we um, sort of did applications piecemeal. This year we're doing it for a season and, and doing them all at once so that we have input as to how many spaces are exactly taken up. Um, the, uh, the additional committee that I'd like to have involved is a Disability Access Commission. Um, the chair was very much involved last year and actually walked um, the streets with us to see um, what made sense to, to plan it out. So I think it makes sense to continue to include them in the discussion this year, especially um, if uh, you know there's going to be potentially ramps or sidewalks and or streets and or um, altered pedestrian access. We definitely need them involved. Um, the other things that maybe Brian, you can highlight a little bit more is just the um, both the aesthetics and the uniformity of the outdoor dining um, materials. So we're, um, we did write that um, into the, the application. We were not as prescriptive as some towns that um, specifically outlined exactly what they wanted, which would be the same for each um, restaurant. So we did have some leeway in terms of using concrete barriers, some other um, heavy uh, combination um, barriers with things that are more decorative as long as they're uniform. Uh, but that's also where um, when we get the applications in, we can provide some guidance through the design review committee and other, other committees that might want to weigh in on that. Um, and I'll just note that on the St. Patrick's Day, that would, um, that would be two weeks earlier than our anticipated start. The major concern that um, staff have with that is that um, you know, especially if they're going to use temporary barriers or the water filled barriers is after St. Patrick's Day, if they're going to remove those barriers, they're going to be letting that water out into the streets and creating sort of sheets of ice and other uh, potential precarious issues. Um, so those were just some of the concerns raised by staff. But I think the application as it is right now, um, the, you know, a couple things to get select board input on is um, adding the Disability Access Commission as one of the committees, um, whether you think a three week time period is um, sort of sufficient to get the word out for an April 1st start or whether you wanna contemplate starting earlier than April 1st. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I, I think um, in some ways our, um, you know, this program is evolving and uh, I'm glad that we're 
including the Disability Access Commission in the conversation um, too. But we're um, one of our goals is still to um, support our restaurants and local businesses at a time when they're really struggling. So I'm glad that we've um, kind of uh, pumped the brakes on being um, very restrict, uh, prescriptive about the aesthetics, because I know a lot of communities are doing that. And there's big upfront costs to um, businesses to uh, get things to, to look perfectly. And um, so uh, maybe we, we lean a little bit more towards um, uh, being a little bit more forgiving on that side as we, you know, build this program over a period of time. But it, it makes sense, um, I think, um, for us to um, consider um, op opening earlier for St. Patrick's Day for some restaurants, see what interest is there, and maybe we uh, include that as part of the, um, the application and they um, say whether they would be interested in that. And then we kind of see, I mean, certainly um, if it's 15 degrees out and you're going to release uh, 200 gallons of water in the middle of the street, you know, um, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so um, it's typically my understanding um, been on the warmer side, um, you know, over um, that period of time, but um, it also could be um, snowing and freezing cold. So who knows, but um, it, it's a good option for us to consider. It's been a long winter for a lot of these businesses that um, especially the, um, the restaurants that have had uh, you know, really been stuck at that kind of 25% capacity uh, number. It's really, really hard to run. So, um, and uh, the other question I had on on the applications is what fee are we charging for the the applications themselves? Um, so we're looking to waive the fee this year. Um, so we actually didn't discuss what we thought we would charge. And I think it makes sense to, yeah. to not have anything. And I would say um, maybe Brian and, and Patty in particular, because Patty is the one that made the application look nice and pretty, um, is we create a, 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 a checkbox with a start date for um, applications that need to be considered for St. Patrick's Day. Um, so at least we have an idea of who would like to be considered for that early opening. Great. Um, sorry, take up so much of your time. Uh, any other questions, uh, members of the board? Um, yeah, I had a question. So the application says outdoor dining slash retail. So we would be open to letting somebody who is not serve, not a restaurant, but is doing retail, um, be able to bring wares out onto um, onto the street as well. Is that is that the idea behind that? Yeah, we certainly would let them apply. Um, it was the same, so that the name of the application ha is the same. So it last um, last time it still was out uh, dining and retail. Um, although I don't believe any retail took advantage. Um, yeah, I don't I think we... two afterwards there were two that wanted to take advantage but didn't didn't really know how how to get their wares out there in a in a safe in a safe way. So I think we could help with that. Uh, we're trying to encourage encourage. Um, retail businesses. And I know how crazy and hard it might seem to try to get your products out on the street during winter when it's 20 something degrees and sleeting and stuff like this. So it it's certainly challenging, but we do want to have that as an option. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe we should, um, we can uh, let the chamber know that it's not just for restaurants and that their uh, retail members can also apply and um, also set up, you know, outdoor um I think last year we tried to do that by closing Thompson Street, but uh, none of the retail businesses brought wares out into the street. So maybe we can get a head start with that this year. Yeah. Last thing, I guess, about that, while you're mentioning about potentially closing the street. Um, so that is something that's not necessarily part of the outdoor dining application specifically for St. Patrick's Day, but that should be be in the back of your in the back of your heads of may, that might be the easiest way to do like a one day rather than um, put a whole bunch of heavy separation on the street just put the separation closing the street off and that's a much quicker because then you're just putting tables and chairs out and just dpw or you know is just putting closing the street off whereas if we're doing a full outdoor dining uh like essentially what we did before with a um closing off all of all of them that's more intense it's going to take longer to break down if there is weather so just something to think about that it might be easier to just close the street off for a day than it is to set up four outdoor dining um barrier uh areas uh, on thompson street 
Yeah, Brian, that makes sense that you get you're not dealing with the water issue as much too. So we could just put Jer we could just put Jersey barriers on, um, on either end, and that could be moved, um, you know, with a, a, a forklift in an emergency at any time. So they could get them. They it could put them there, put it there for the day. Mm -hmm. The forklift could be there for the day, and then that'll be it. I think we've been working um, pretty closely with the chamber um, on discussions um, around the um, uh, outdoor dining and retail component of it as well. So. Um, uh, the uh, chambers uh, definitely been been helpful in um, supporting both parts of the the application too. So um, we thank them. I I do want to note that um, it looks like the heavy, loud, potentially noisy and dusty construction from the MBTA is going to go on through the end of April. Um, so there will be some overlap between the beginning of the outdoor dining season and the tail end, and then. Um, my understanding is that they're going to then mobilize a larger project sometime in September with probably construction in October, November. So again, sort of at the tail end of, of the dining season. Um, so we'll, we'll keep an eye on that and we'll see if we can learn any lessons from what happens in, um, in April. Um, we'll um, be making a lot of the uh, dust, noise, et cetera, control plans available um, to folks publicly. So we'll, we'll post those on the website so people have an idea of, of um, what the MBTA is planning on doing. And of course, there's a there's a hotline number too that um, we want to direct people to. Great. Um, thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Brian. Um, are there any other questions from members of the board and comments? Thanks. Um, we're going to jump to uh, item uh Business item uh, H2, that's on our supplemental agenda, the Climate Action Advisory Committee uh, EV charger proposal. Uh, and then uh, after that, we're going to um, go into the uh, historical commission uh, discussion as well. So just giving everybody an idea of where we are. So I think uh, Ruth Trimarkey is here, the uh, Climate Action Chair. Uh, if we could elevate uh, Ruth. Hey Ruth, how are you? Thank you for your patience. Thank you and good evening. Um, could we also unmute Leighton, Ken Pruitt, and Kristen Patnod, who are here to answer questions? And while you're doing that, I'll just say that I'm Ruth Trimarkey, Chair of the Climate Action Advisory Committee. Um, and I'm here this evening to ask the board's permission to submit a new state grant for the uh, high-speed EV charging stations. Patty, is there a PowerPoint that you're gonna put up for this? Yes, are you ready for it? I am, thank you. Okay. So while um, that is coming up, I think everyone here knows Wei Chen and Ken Pruitt, but they are um, architects of the 2020 Winchester Climate Action Plan. And they, along with Brian Zakelli, have done the huge amount of heavy lifting on this grant. It's a technical grant. It's not a lot of writing. It's a lot of research. Um, so I want to remind the board that two years ago, you voted unanimously to endorse a statement that Winchester is going to be um, going to reduce greenhouse gases 80% by 2050. I want to let you know that Governor Baker has upped the ante, and the state is now headed to net zero for 2050. And since 40% of carbon pollution, not just in Winchester, but across the state is due to transportation, that's uh, a good target to reduce. Um, I'm going to spend a couple of, uh, a little bit of time on this second slide here, and then we're going to zip through the rest. So don't lose patience. <laughs> um, Baker's also mandated that all cars in Massachusetts, new cars that are going to be sold, have to be electric by 2035. So uh, in order to um, incentivize that transition, there's this new grant called EVIP, and it has a very short turnaround. Across my desk in the middle of January, it's due in a few weeks, mid uh, March 19th. And every indication we have from federal and state level is that there's going to continue to be increased in sustained funding for electric vehicles and for the infrastructure. So that's why we've put this out to, to you. We've, we have a $50,000 grant. We want you to 
say, yes, you can go ahead and apply for this. And it's to continue to build Winchester's infrastructure to support EVs by everyone. And that's one of the goals of the 2020 Climate Action Plan. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the key features of this mass EVIP grant are that it's from the Department of Environmental Protection. It's called an electric vehicle incentive program, covers 100% of hardware and installation costs. These are called DCFCs, it's direct current fast charger. And when they're on government owned property, which we're gonna to propose two locations, they cover 100%. They give you a full charge in 30 to 60 minutes. Next slide, please. Thank you, Patty, I'm glad you fit this in. So uh, these are the two locations that we are proposing. The first is on Skillings Road. It's across from, it's right in front of Stop and Shop and across from Skillings Field. The second is on Shore Road. It too is close to the sports fields. Both of those locations right close to the high school are walkable to downtown. You see Mount Vernon Street there. Next slide. So the advantages of the first Skillings Field are that it's accessible to the school, the sports field, the grocery stores, and close enough to downtown. It has high visibility and it's in an environmental justice neighborhood as defined by the state. That means you get a point for that on this particular grant application. It's also a scalable area. Next slide. The second location on Shore Road has the same accessibilities. It has medium visibility because it's tucked around the corner just a little out of the mainstream. It is not in an EJ neighborhood, so it will not get that additional point from the uh, state, but it directly abuts it. So in terms of the town trying to bring services to an environmental justice area, it's literally a half a block away. It's scalable and it's less busy than Skillings. Next slide. There's a few other locations that we worked with Brian Zakelli to target. We, um, he's been very generous in helping us work through the details of this. So in looking long-term down the road, where else could we put this? Um, it's in, there are, um, let's see, Gin Parking Lot, Wind Cam Lot, Elementary Schools, Wright Lock Farm, and the new MBTA Station Parking Lot are a few options. Next slide. So what we're asking the board to do tonight is to authorize conversion of two parking spots. Turns out we're, um, sorry, uh, we're able to, for this amount of money, $50,000 with the quotes that Mr. Pruitt's brought in, we're able to put in for two parking spots at um, each of two proposed locations for use by electric vehicles accessing a DCFC charger. We're also trying to make it a little easier for the board so we don't have to come back like in a year and say, hey, we found another grant and could we do this again? So we're asking you to authorize additional spots for future use. Um, that could be done by authorizing a town planner, engineer, or a select board designee, or designing some guidelines and tell us stay away from this area and target that area. And my apologies, I just got a correction from one of my uh, coworkers here that it's the Skilling Field parking lot, not the road. So with that, I'm done and I invite your questions and my colleagues to jump in and answer things. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. And uh, thank you again um, to all members of the Climate Action Committee and everyone that's uh, been participating in these grants. There are a lot of work um, to put together and you don't always get them, but you got to keep them moving. And we've been um, really a great beneficiary of um, a lot of these and uh, certainly it um, continues to, to support the uh, climate action plan that um, uh, is a priority for the town. So um, questions or comments? Thank you, Mike. Hi Ruth, this is Amy Shapiro. Thank you so much for the presentation and for all the work you did. Um, I just have a couple questions. Are there any current um, spots that we have in Winchester right now? Is my first question. My second question is if, if so, how often are they being used? And if not, do you have any sense of what, um, what the usage needs are within Winchester for this type of service? Thank you, Amy. Uh, I missed the first word. Are you asking if there are other spots already with these high-speed um, charging stations in them? Is that your question? That was my first question. The answer is no. We have some level two um, chargers. You've probably seen those behind the town hall and on Laraway and at the high school. I think those are all of them. And how long does it, how long do those take to charge a 
five to eight hours for full charge versus 30 to 60 minutes for these. It depends okay. on the vehicle, of course. And how uh, often they're used, that's an interesting question. I don't have that data. I don't well, know. Well, I can give some answer because I do charge in some of those places. Uh, the one in the high school and the one in the uh, train station parking lot, they are uh, frequently used because sometimes when I go there, it's occupied. Uh, and both locations has two chargers. And the one behind the library, uh, that two are mostly used by the uh, towns, uh, towns uh, uh, there are two EVs uh, of the town, from the town. So they park there. So basically they are not uh, uh, open to the public yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do we have a way to, through excise um, motor vehicle excise to know how many electric vehicles we have in town at the moment? That's the data we have. Uh, my data shows from the uh, from from the uh, office that uh, collect exercise tax. So it roughly is about 1% of the times or car or, or electric uh, vehicles. 1%. Right now, 1%. Okay. okay, thank you. Great, thanks. The other question I had, um, Ruth, too, is if we've uh, reached out to the schools on um, either of these locations, but um, the skillings one, I guess, too. I don't know if, um, and that might be um, part of our kind of uh, delegation um, of this um, appointment to the town manager or town planner or uh, town engineer. Um, but as I know that we really want to on these locations, at least get the um, get the grant moving. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I have not reached out to them. Um, I have reached out to TTAC, but we haven't connected yet. Uh, but their focus is a little different anyhow. Um, I'm happy to do that. It'd be great if it goes through Brian or Beth. OK. Yeah. Um, thank you, Ruth, and you know everybody else um, who's working on the grant. I, I know it takes um, a lot of time to to write these grants. So um, uh, I'm totally in favor of the current two spots as as proposed. I think um, also in the future we should look at um, the parking lot that is hourly, uh, that is um, off of uh, Waterfield Road. Um, you know, by the train station. I think uh, a lot of people use that um, to go for an hour into the town center, into some business. And uh, if they can charge their EV while they are um, shopping in, in the town center, um, I think that might also get a lot of use. So, um, you know, as far as uh, the part in your presentation where you asked what other locations, I think that would be, uh, that would be a good one. Thank you, Mariano. The other consideration yeah. for us to, oh, sorry, I was going to ask just while we're talking about where these are, just um, is this two parking spaces on each of, is it the Skillings um, parking lot by the Skilling, by the field, and then two on Thompson? No, it's, okay. um, my understanding is that it is one I'm going to have to ask Ken Pruitt to clarify that question. I'm not sure. Thank sure. You. Thank you. We're, it, it would be two spots uh, in one of the two lots, but we're asking for authorization for both lots, knowing that we may we, ultimately one will be more favorable than the other, um, especially from the standpoint of bringing in the electrical infrastructure, which uh, Eversource, um, Eversource would do. And so um, we're, we're asking for authorization to, to reserve two spots um, at, at both lots at this point, but ultimately it would just be at one lot that we did this. Okay, um, well, uh, if we wanna move this along, um, I'm happy to take a motion to um, kind of approve those both, both those uh, locations for um, the grant to move forward with. So I move that we um, permit the town to go ahead um, and submit applications for these um, NAS EVIP um, charging stations. Um, and we authorize the conversion of two parking spots on Skillings Field parking lot and 
on Thompson Street to be used for these. Uh, uh, not Thompson Street, Shore Road. Oh, sorry. Thompson Street was the other um, discussion. Sorry. So on Skellings Road and um, Shore Road. Shore Road. Um, and I think that is that that's it. Yes. For now. Okay. I just wanted to clarify it's or not, not and, right? Skillings or. Yes. Okay. Just wanted to clarify. Not right. and. Or. Well, I mean, I, I think we should leave it open to and or in case that they can, we can apply for two grants for two different locations. Thank you, Mariano. That makes good sense. And or. And I'll or, second that. And, and also just a kind of a friendly amendment there too, just um, as a suggestion to um, speak with the schools um, as well uh, about skillings. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Um, so the it, motion has been moved and seconded. I'll take a roll call vote. Uh, all in favor, Susan? Yes. Amy? Yes. Mariano? Yes. And yes for me, motion carries unanimously four to zero. Um, thank you, uh, Ken, Kristen, Way, and um, I know Brian's been uh, helping out a lot too, and uh, certainly Ruth, so uh, we appreciate it. Thank Good you. Good luck. Have Keep our day. fingers crossed. Bye. Um, Next up uh, is the uh, local historic uh, district um, discussion. I think uh, there are a couple of members uh, here from the Historical Commission, Jack Lamanage. I'm not sure who else is um, with you, Bruce Hickey maybe, Janet, whoever is uh, planning on jumping in. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak first. Uh, Jack Lamanage, chairman of the commission. Um, I, I'd like to, let Brian speak first uh, to the immediate question of the standing study committee that at present has been working on the uh, business, the downtown business district as a potential local historic district. Brian, can you speak to that? Sure. Um, so uh, the local historic district study committee sent a memo to the select board on January 21st, kind of outlining uh, what we've done over the past uh, year and a half. Um, so the Town Center National Register District is obviously, um, you know, a character defining element of Winchester. Um, current zoning in the Center Business District requires site plan review for all exterior changes. And there are also some restrictions on historically significant buildings already. The Local Historic District Study Committee um, has extensively tried to engage the town center property owners, uh, as well as the renters, uh, commercial tenants. Uh, and we have found uh, that demolition is not something that is a high priority for them at the moment. Um, you know, this, this kind of makes sense as we, we have not really seen that, that typical grassroots effort um, to preserve the area uh, with, it, with a local historic district. Um, however, want to make clear that we know that there is very there is broad support in town for protecting the town center but if the property owners are really not on board um, or are, are ambivalent we're trying to get some direction from the select board on whether we should continue to pursue an LHD downtown um, and whether or not town meeting would potentially support the creation of an LHD where right now less than 50 percent of the property owners slash renters really wouldn't agree with the uh, local historic district concept. So we're, we're at a crossroads specifically with, with the downtown district, um, potential uh, local historic district. And we, we would like some guidance on either, uh, you know, either a high, it, w w the options are either kind of put it on hold uh, or try different uh, or try to reach out to outside of the town center, outside of the property owners to get that um, uh, that, that kind of grassroots organization. But um, we, just to be clear, we have, we have had some issues with property owners in the district want, wanting to be part of the district. Um, so that, that's kind of one aspect of why we're here tonight is kind of like looking, looking for some direction on, you know, really what we, what we could do. Um, and like I said, the options are like, focus on a different area, kind of put it on hiatus for the moment, 
<clears throat> completely scrap it, which is we're not we're not really asking for that. Um, but you know, those are kind of the options that that uh, we have at the moment. Thanks, Brian. Um, uh, this uh, has been a, a great project from the beginning, so we appreciate that it's, it's moving forward. Um, you know, I, I think if it's going to be, uh, from my perspective, uh, um, a long, you know, longer battle in the um, downtown area, um, you know, maybe that we uh, look, uh, you know, outside into other neighborhoods to um, maybe get the lower hanging fruits. And as we kind of uh, move towards uh, the greater goal, but, um, you know, happy to um, consider other alternatives. Um, I don't know if there are members of the board that have an opinion on it either. Brian, what, um, what added protections um, or concerns are there about, above and beyond the CBD and the site plan review and the, the, the protections you mentioned around historic buildings? Like what, what additional guidelines would there be if we did this? in downtown area sure um so right now there's a restriction on historically significant buildings in the downtown there are a number of buildings that have been deemed historically significant and those buildings um basically if you tear down one of those buildings one of these historically significant buildings um, you would not be able to receive a special permit for three years. So that's currently what's on the books right now. That is what the Massachusetts Historical Commission, as well as other preservationists, would consider not full preservation. Um, it is, certainly has teeth, and it certainly um, you know, may, makes someone think twice about trying to demolish a historically significant building. So, I mean, it does, it, it, it is... It is a preservation tactic. It is not full preservation. What this would do would be able to actually preserve all those buildings that we really don't want to see go away. Um, so it definitely would be an added protection. It's a question of if there's really not, you know, if there isn't a real threat to demolition in the in the downtown, you know, what what would be the main reason to do this? And that, that's that's really what we kept kept kind of struggling with is that. Usually the, the LHDs that are successful, they're, they're successful because the property owners want to make it happen. Uh, and they're the ones making it happen. It's usually not a, 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 a staff level or historical commission level kind of going down. Right. But what we have seen is that, you know, there are areas, there are pockets of neighborhoods that definitely are under threat um, for demolition, and we are hearing <laughs> we are hearing from the, from those property owners um, in pockets of neighborhoods all over town. Um, per perhaps now would be a good time for me to jump in because uh, it's, a, it's a good it's a good segue. Um, in the, the past few years, the the neighborhood, and I speak in the general fashion, what which I refer to as Upper Grove Street the area that runs pretty much from Sims Corner, which Sims Corner, for those of you who don't know, is the uh, traffic circle where Bacon, Main Street, and Grove meet. If you consider the, 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 uh, the properties right there at Sims Corner and you go down Grove Street about a quarter mile, and uh, in that immediate neighborhood, um, there have been two subdivisions of, of two historic properties within the last few years, which really upset the neighborhood, brought in some um, out of character uh, houses built there. And I think the straw that broke the camel's back was in December, the historical commission held a demolition permit hearing for a property on Grove Street that dates back to at least by our records about 1839 and um, the neighbor, we had, a, we had quite a turnout for our hearing on that and subsequent to our imposition of a 12 month delay on the issuance of the permit, uh, I as chair got quite a bit of email from neighbors saying, what can we do? What, how, how can we prevent this house from being uh, demolished? And I think um, if I may say we could leverage, my, my first thought was to leverage that that uh, neighborhood activism and interest uh, to perhaps uh, 
create our first local historic district there. And, and to what Brian said, I think we stand a much better chance of getting the two thirds vote from town meeting if we've got neighborhood support. Um, we did a preliminary, and I do, I do emphasize preliminary, but we did a preliminary study of that neighborhood. And if you look at contiguous properties, um, and I would characterize it as a contiguous area of well-preserved, truly historic properties, we counted 44 properties, uh, 25 of which date from the 19th century, one as far back as 1803. The remaining 19 of those 44 were built in the early part of the, of the 20th century. So um, we feel, and Brian's putting up this map to give you a sense of what we're talking about here. If you, if you start toward the right center where, uh, where, the, where the traffic circle is, and you follow Grove Street all the way down to, uh, well, the, the side streets aren't labeled, but pretty much off, almost to off the map. And then, um, yeah, down to number 33. And then back out, if you look at um, the, the upper end of Brook Street, not there, the, uh, the other end of Brook Street where, where it comes back, and then Sanborn Street, all those houses in their date in the, into the 19, 1900s, I'm sorry, the 1800s, and then Fenwick Road to the, on the up, upper side of the map, those are all early, 19th century, or early 20th century houses. So our thinking, and these, these are the contiguous properties that we were counting, 44 properties that we think may form the basis of a local historic district. Um, I think we can get some neighborhood support and with the study committee, we may wind up with fewer than 44. But on the other hand, if you look around the corner at Bacon Street, there's some there's some historic properties there too. So it may actually wind up being bigger. And if you look at uh, Ridgefield Road, there's a few historic properties over there. It's really dependent upon what the study committee comes up with for a recommendation and the neighborhood and the level of neighborhood enthusiasm. So I'm very optimistic that we've that we've got this. Um, one, one, one resident wrote me an email yesterday and she's got a raft of historical information, which I found fascinating that she had in her own home that she had collected over the years about her own house and neighboring properties. So there's a lot of stuff that we, 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 we I'd say we really have a running start on this. I'm kind of excited. Thanks, Jack. Oh. Uh, um, oh, sorry, Brian. Sorry, the only thing I, I uh, point of clarification um, that this is this would be a general bylaw. Uh, so this was always a simple majority, uh, regardless of. Oh, the, is that right? I didn't yeah, realize so, that. So, 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 regardless of the new zoning change that that allows for zoning now to be at a simple majority, this this has always been a general bylaw and was always uh, simple majority. Okay, good, good to know. Still, I think uh, I think my point stands though. I, we're going to have a lot better chance. As Brian said earlier about this, this the uh, this, the center business district. I think we'll have a better chance in a neighborhood where where people, the property owners themselves, are concerned about the preserving the historical character of the neighborhood. So, I mean, with that, I would ask that perhaps the select board consider uh, appointing or, or or I forget what the phrasing is. I, I sent you the the motion language. Um, Mike that uh, Massachusetts Historical Commission recommends, but to form a, a new study committee with an eye toward getting a, um, um, a local historic district before fall town meeting. Um, thanks, Jack. I appreciate it. And, you know, and, and just so everyone knows, you, you know, we've had um, a lot of success over the past several years um, with developers and residents um, working together to uh, preserve homes and um, also, um, you know, make make changes uh, that you know, worked for new homeowners as well. Uh, particularly there on uh, Grove Street, um, there was a demolition permit, uh, and I forget the number of that fairly large house there, Jack. You, I'm sure all you guys would know it, but um, you know, there there were concessions made where the uh, neighbors worked with the developer and added in. Um, it kind of split the lot there, and so it was. Um, you know, the, ha having these, um, um, you know, having a, an LHD, you know, kind of, uh, I think encourages people to work together while protecting, you know, historic 
um, and historically significant assets. So um, it's 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 difficult though to um, chase all over town, um, and, and if you're not protecting large kind of swaths of uh, of areas that are important to residents. So um, certainly uh, sounds like a good idea. And let me just see if I have that um, language here. I trust that the people that the that the that the members of the select board also realize that the initiation or the, the establishment of a local hi historic district does uh, allow Winchester to become a certified local government, which opens us up to all sorts of opportunities for grants, which we do not have at the moment. Thanks, Jack. I think that was one of the um, reasons that we were really kind of moving forward with the study right. as well, uh, that in mind. So, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll um, move forward. Uh, Susan, I didn't know if you had that motion in front of you or if you want me to read it. Um, well, it, it's, is this a motion for us and not, yeah, I guess it's a motion for us and not something that would go on the warrant. Is that what you're saying? Right, exactly. Okay. So um, I can read it and say that we move to establish under the provisions of Massachusetts General Law Chapter 40C, General Laws, a local historic district study committee consisting of three to seven members, which shall make an investigation and report on the historic significance of the building structures, features, sites, or surroundings included in such proposed local historic district as the committee may recommend, and shall submit a final report with its recommendations after a public hearing together with a map of the proposed district or districts and a draft of the proposed bylaw to town meeting. Second. All in favor, I'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Susan? Yes. Amy? Yes. Mariano? Yes. And yes for me, motion carries unanimously uh, four to zero. Uh, thank you uh, very much to the historical commission, Jack and Bruce and Jen and um, uh, everyone. I know it's been a long night. You guys have already been uh, in, in meetings. So uh, uh, thank you for your service and uh, we'll, uh, let us know what we need to do. Brian, what, well, sorry, forgot something. Sorry, um, the, um, so thank you for that, for that vote. Um, still need a little direction and maybe now is not the time. Uh, but we we still will need it because this would be a different oh, local okay. historic district study committee. So we have a local historic district study committee right now that's on this, that's in the center business district. We're trying to figure out what to do with that committee. We now just with that vote has a we have established a different local historic district study meet to to look at this neighborhood. Um, if you don't have an answer now, that's totally fine. I you guys have a, a lot still left to do, but. Um, I, no, I think I, I think we're we're moving in the right direction. Right? Jack, Jack, do you, you have a recommendation here? I think that you had said to focus more on the neighborhood. To... Yeah, I, I seen. I think uh, Brian said earlier that perhaps you just consider, and I don't even know that you need to formalize this. Just put the the other study committee on hiatus or on back burner, whatever language you choose to use, and just move move forward with this as a separate study committee. It's not a reassignment of the existing committee. It's a new new study committee that I would fully expect to have at least one or two um, property owners from that neighborhood uh, as members. Okay. Thanks. Makes sense? Yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay, good, thanks. Um, so do we need a motion or? Yeah, I think so. We might as well vote on just to yeah. kind of clarify. Um, so I move that we um, place a pause on the activities of the local historic district study committee for downtown second uh, all in favor i'll take a um, roll call vote uh susan yes amy yes mariana yes and yes for me motion carries unanimously you um does that work thank, thank you. you yes wonderful yeah. thanks again yep. thanks for your hard work thanks okay. everyone um uh, next up, uh, we'll move to uh, business item six, the uh, field policy. I think uh, Nick uh, Kachalfi is here. And I uh, apologize, Nick, if I'm uh, butchering the pronunciation of your last name. No, you did a good job. Thank you. <laughs> um, thanks, thanks for coming in. I, I know uh, it's uh, been a little bit crazy lately. So um, what uh, what can we do for you? Um, so tonight, uh, I'd like, uh, I'm asking for select board's approval to accept the changes uh, made to the field policy document. 
Um, the field, the last time the, the document was edited is 2013. Um, and the field committee made us, uh, we, we put together a subcommittee that critically looked at it over uh, three, three uh, pretty long meetings. Um, and what we found is that um, there were some outdated practices. There were some ina inaccuracies and um, some confusing parts of the document that really needed to be to be changed and, and updated to to current uh, statuses, um, so that we're more efficient in assigning the fields, um, and we're more concise in uh, in the field policies, um, so that it's easier to navigate for for the citizens in town and for the organizations and individuals that are looking to uh, rent fields. Um, I'd sent out uh, a couple of the document the the old the old uh, docs and the uh, the new ones with changes and the high level changes. Um, did you want me to to go over the high level changes um, and then open it up to any questions based on the changes that we're making? Yeah, I think that Double makes point. sense. Just 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 an overview, and um, then we'll we'll see if there's uh, any questions. It seems like there are pretty sen sensible changes, and we appreciate all the work that goes into this to kind of modernize and make things up to date. Yeah, so um, just a, a high level overview is, is basically we restructured both permitting uh, procedures for um, individual reservations and organizations. They were, they were quite cumbersome and they were a pretty long process. And now that we have uh, new software, we've, we've created it to be a, a quicker turnaround time and make it less um, um, intensive for, uh, for staffing and for the, the requesters. Um, we changed the, uh, there's, there's a section about the bylaws and the fields that were, fees that were collected and we actually mirrored it. So it read exactly as both revolving account bylaws read. So it's completely accurate, um, and exactly how it was intended. Um, we've added language, um, in the permitting of additional spaces, um, with the basketball and tennis court section to also include um any additional spaces that are not field space rental rentals or traditional spaces um including volleyball courts which we are hoping to at some point install some town volleyball courts um with with a, a minor fees increased on the volleyball court on the court rentals um the camp and clinic fee structure um, was pretty confusing it said it was based on 15 percent of gross revenue and there was a big chart that um, was a fee chart that didn't actually represent 15%. So we got rid of the, the chart and, and set it to uh, straight 15% gross revenue. Um, we cleaned up language and scheduling conflict section, appeal processes and refund and timing uh, and uh, deposits. And uh, we added language um, to reflect state laws regarding Corey and national background checks, which was missing. Um, and we also added a section, and this was based on uh, feedback from citizens to reflect responsibilities users have in caring and abiding by posted regulations in uh, abutting neighborhoods and uh, just care for the neighborhoods as well. And uh, we just added a bunch of language for policies for closing fields due to uh, weather and unplayable conditions. But for the most part, we uh, it is mostly uh, clearing up you know, confusing lines and, and making it, like I said, more efficient in assigning fields. Thanks, Nick. I, I think part of it is um, not just generating more revenue, um, but also to uh, kind of encourage more usage and, uh, you know, uh, more activity. And so, um, so it's great. We appreciate it. Any questions or comments? Um, yeah, I, on the table for the uh, permit fee schedule, uh, I don't know if I'm if you mentioned this and I missed it, but I don't see skillings. Um, so on the uh, I'm assuming it's page the second to last page. Yeah, where there's a table with the fees. Yeah, so that would just be a skillings would be considered the, a turf permit, unless you're going to rent the grass fields, and you would be on uh, just the regular grass lane, which is the first the first okay. column. So, so the turf permits uh, so, third column covers both Manchester turf and Skillings. Oh, okay, so the Knowlton Stadium one is specifically because of the press box usage. Is that why that's 
broken out then? Correct. Yeah, that would be if someone wanted to use the press box, they have okay. as additional fees. Got it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Amy, I didn't know if you wanted to weigh in a little bit. Um, I know you've been working with Nick a lot uh, lately on this. Yeah, no, I think, um, Nick, thanks for your leadership on this and, and certainly the members of the field management committee that, that supported you in the subcommittee, they did a lot of work on this. Um, and I think that, I think in addition, Mike, to your to increasing revenue, I think also increasing compliance is gonna be really important going forward. And I think this is a really smart, uh, smart way to clean things up, as Nick said, and and get us into a, a more efficient process. So um, I mean, yeah, I think they, Nick, done a really great job and I think that um, the committee is very supportive and uh, voted unanimously to support the policy so yeah I was just going to say that this, these all sound like Mike said very sensible and that uh, it is a lot of work to update something that's you know this detailed and that hasn't been touched in a number of years so I, I think it was a really smart move to do this and one of the things that we're doing is we're making more things more transparent. So all of these are available. They weren't before for download. You'd actually have to request all this. It's all on our the town side recreation web page, including field uh, permitting um, fee, uh, request forms as well. So it's all out there so that more people are more apt to do the go by the, the board and do, do the right thing with, 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 with requesting fields. Great, thanks. So, um, do uh, we just need to take a vote to uh, approve this? Is that what you're looking for, Nick? Yes, please. Okay. And, and just to clarify, you we, we you went you talked to the school committee as well about this. Can you? Just yes, thank you, Amy. I, I'm sorry, I admitted that. I did talk to the school committee. They did look through, and they said since nothing has changed on the school side as far as the field, and it was more about um, you know uh, the recreation policies and. and Forcing and stuff. They they said they would. They did not need to vote on it, and that it should go directly to the select board. So I move that we approve the revised and restated field policy as presented. Second. All in favor, I'll take a roll call vote. Susan. Yes. Amy. Yes. Mariano. Yes. And yes, for me, motion carries unanimously, four to zero. Uh, thanks, Nick. Uh, keep up the good work. We'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thanks, you too. Um, so we'll jump around a little bit. Um, I, I see the controllers here too, so uh, we can jump to the uh, FY22 budget discussion and um, in case there are questions for Stacy. Uh, I know, Lisa, you had a, a PowerPoint for us as well. Um, okay, so um, not to be redundant with a prior presentation to the select board, um, but I just want to go over some um, highlights from the budget. Um, the first is that um, on a revenue side, um, you know, things that do continue to grow every year, uh, property taxes by two and a half percent. Also, we're looking to use the remaining fiscal year 20 override uh, capacity, which is $1.7 million. So that's in the revenues. Um, state aid, this fluctuates. Um, so, so far the governor's budget has a, um, a, a fairly minor increase in um, unrestricted government general aid and local um, and chapter 70 aid. We do anticipate um, that we'll get more school aid. So that's reflected in the budget. Um, I think the governor only put in about 1.4% increase. Um, it's pretty low across the state because it reflects the declining enrollment that many school districts saw in COVID. Um, there is supposed to be a course correction. Um, it could come a number of different ways, but in talking with the school department, um, we agree that $200,000 additional in that state aid line item um, is probably the right number to put in there. Um, so that, that's reflected in terms of the revenues. 
um, for the department budgets, um, the municipal and school increases are 6.4% um, for the municipal budgets and a 406 for the school budgets. The municipal budget um, increase does reflect the third year of a collective bargaining agreement. Um, and it has some market adjustments in there. That's why it's higher than, than usual. Um, the school requested budget at 4.06 um, is higher than their request from last year, which was actually just under four, uh, but they're also anticipating some enrollment increases in here. Um, some budget highlights for the next fiscal year. Um, there are two new positions that we are highlighting in the budget. One is a sustainability director. Um, I say it's new, but I did put it in my budget last year, but we did take it out due to COVID um, or the uncertainty over COVID and revenues. And a mental health clinician, um, which is a position that has been championed by um, the police department um, uh, and various um, entities in town who believe that mental health is um, something that, that we need to increasingly address as a local government. Um, so this, uh, the sustainability director position right now is um, embodied in the town manager budget, though there is some discussion about making that its own department. Um, the mental health clinician is right now embedded in the police department budget, uh, but we hope that this position will work with um, departments and organizations throughout the town. Um, there is a noticeable decrease in the town clerk's budget. This is due to less elections this year. She had quite the uh, the year last year with many, many weeks of early voting. Um, the union contracts with market adjustments are incorporated in this budget. The contracts for the next three fiscal years, um, 23 to 25 are to be determined and have to be negotiated. And that's mostly relevant for um, the, uh, the forecasting tool. Um, the increase in health insurance, um, it was originally five. Um, we were then told that because of um, uh, positive trends um, with, um, you know, high uh, sort of high dollar, um, uh, you know, individuals, um, you know, being taken off the plan or um, their condition being, um, you know, no longer part of the, the trend data um, that this 5% number was actually going to go down to about 2 to 3%. Um, that has since gone back up to 4.9%. Um, as of Friday afternoon, I had a conversation with our consultant and um, they said that health insurance plans are beginning to incorporate COVID impacts. So that adds a couple of percentage points across the board. So a safe number to put in here would be 4.9. Um, the budget also includes approximately a million. Um, this number currently is just under 900,000 in the budget that's been shown to you, but we are still trying to calculate uh, the potential fiscal 22 um, costs due to vaccines and more testing, um, which we'll talk about um, a reserve fund transfer for those two line items for this current fiscal year, but we're still trying to measure what the impact is for next year. So my guess is that we'll push the COVID impacts the next year um, up above a million dollars. It's in a separate line item. So it's been taken out of individual, individual departments and put as a separate line item to be funded by free cash or knock on wood, um, hopefully by um, any upcoming stimulus packages from the federal government that might include funding for COVID and local cities and towns. Um, the building department has um, a, a noticeable increase. Most departments are level funded, so um, you'll see that there's columns um, that I'll show you in a bit that show the dollar increase and the percentage increase, so they, they stick out. This $18,000 is part of an annual payment for their new e-permitting system. Um, the setup for the system is about $17,000, and that's being covered by a uh, a state grant, but this is the annual fees for that system. Um, the fire budget, um, you'll see there's a pretty big shift from overtime, which goes down by 150,000 into salaries, um, which goes up. Um, it also 
um, and incorporates the market adjustment um, in the third year of their contract. There's an expectation that um, we'll potentially be able to grab um, as much as six new people um, to fill vacancies. We actually have seven vacancies um, and we have some uh, at least one anticipated retirement, um, but we're hoping to at least get six new hires. We've been pretty shorthanded for quite some time. Um, the larger salaries also um, reflects the uh, third and final year of the SAFER grant, um, which has been decreasing over the, the years that we've had it. In this year, there's only an offset of $45,000. Um, for the police budget, um, we have continued to delay uh, hiring a part-time dispatcher. Um, so that was taken out of um, their budget between the request and the town manager budget. Um, and also um, we're reducing the purchase of two vehicles uh, per year to one. Um, we'll probably bring it back up to two in subsequent years, but um, we did have an extra purchase of a, of a vehicle for the police department, um, primarily to be used for the fells. Um, so it is an extra vehicle. Usually these new vehicles um, are put into patrol and then the, the patrol cars are then um, circulated back down to let's say the detective unit. Um, we think that the, the current capacity of the cars right now can, can withstand just um, reducing that to one car this year. So keep these in mind. I'm going to actually bring up Uh, the first of two spreadsheets. So this um, this spreadsheet, um, the master 22, this is um, sort of the core sheet that we use to build the budget book. And then the next document I'll show you is actually the budgeting tool. They're, um, they're a little bit different in how they present. But, um, so this is a summary of um, the individual departments. Um, for fiscal year 22, um, alongside my requests. Um, it's, I just wanna note that the capital dollars are um, not yet in the budget. Those hopefully will be voted Wednesday night. Um, those are passed through. So they'll increase the total line of the budget, but not, not the net. Uh, the next tab um, is the municipal budgets. And what I did is I went through and highlighted in yellow um, the various changes that I made. And then there's some notes in this last column. So for example, um, this town manager budget, which shows an increase of 80, 86,000. Um, this line item here is uh, primarily the sustainability director, um, but there's also, um, so in this temporary line item here, um, this reflects the uh, request by the design review committee to have a recording secretary and also um, incorporates the new recording secretary that we have for the climate action plan. Um, so, you know, there's small adjustments I made, for example, um, you know, professional services and human resources just decreased it by a thousand. So just, um, you can see some of these, but the um, uh, most of the major changes have been reflected in the PowerPoint presentation that I gave you. Um, there's some that are outliers, like uh, the treasurer's office actually added a new financial analyst position, so I actually took that out. Um, so this was in fact not a not a level service budget. Um, most requests were level service budgets um, for engineering and planning. Um, their typical request of 75,000, um, they were actually both reduced by 15,000 and planning it was 75 to 60 and sorry, in engineering was 75 to 60 and planning it was 50 to 35. Um, they requested um, their fiscal year 20, I just reduced those by five. Um, so annual subscriptions, um, this is the billing department. You'll see this 18-4. Uh, 
that I talked about for e-permitting. Um, the original request was 23. There was a couple of add-ons that um, we're not gonna initiate the first year. But you can see where most departments will actually show zero and then a major increase. Um, some of these numbers were originally reflected in the IT budget and they've been shifted over to individual budgets. Um, this is the clerk's office. Um, There's just some various notes, but um, they, they did have a decrease because of the um, less uh, COVID impacts and, and less um, uh, elections. Um, the IT department, uh, I think this is one of the rare exceptions where it looks like the salary number went down, but the fiscal year 21 budget actually had a part a very small part-time position in there, but um, it doesn't have that in fiscal year 22. So that number is right. I'm just gonna skip down. So police and fire, um, the police ads here in the summary, this reflects the, um, the added mental health clinician. The decrease here um, reflects the reduction in the part-time dispatch. And then um, this 52,000 here, it's 52,000 per vehicle reflects the reduction from the purchase of two to one. So just two more budgets. Um, the fire department, um, the chief did include um, a deputy chief position in here. It's a new position. Uh, we have not had one, so I removed that from um, his request. And then here's the, here's the shift in terms of his request for overtime, reducing that by 150,000. Okay, and the last one is um, DPW. There are just, there's some small reductions that have made, you know, 2,500 to 1,500 um, throughout here. Uh, the major areas to look at are actually in red. Um, these two areas like COVID supplies, 50, obviously I took that out. I put that in a different um, line item here, 50 here, and then uh, right here, 200,000 in COVID overtime. Um, so that's reflected here. And then there's another line item of over half a million dollars. This is the sanitation for the buildings. I also took that out and, and put that here. So this is a separate COVID spreadsheet that then correlates um, to a line item um, that's in the budget. So. One more quick share. Okay, so here's the budget forecasting tool. Um, so this takes the numbers that you saw in uh, the previous um, budget book worksheet um, and it plugs it in here. You'll see that there is um, these pass-throughs that are highlighted in green and blue um, and yellow for capital. Um, those will be put in uh, Wednesday night um, and those will be pass-throughs for the budget. Again, you'll see them on both um, the revenue and the expense side. So scrolling down, you'll see that um, fiscal year 22 is balanced, um, carrying those numbers over to 23, 24, and 25. Um, you'll start to see that, um, that budget gap. So fiscal year 23, the budget gap is currently 1.4. Um, fiscal year 24, it's over three and then goes up to five. The blue areas are the assumptions that we make um, in order to, um, to create those numbers. And obviously there's, um, there's a lot of these assumptions that, that change. So for example, this line item here is state aid. Um, this is only um, 
increasing state aid by 100,000. Um, and you'll see, sorry if I'm moving too fast, but you'll see um, like education, we have uh, four, four and 5% increases or 5% for salary, 4% for um, expenses. So um, typically if this school number is going up, it's because of increased enrollment. Um, that will probably yield more than a hundred thousand dollar increase in, in state aid. So some of these are just are very conservative numbers. We can start to um, to build more realistic numbers now that we have firmed up the fiscal year twenty two numbers and start to um, you know build build a better formula for closing um, closing this one point four million dollar gap. So our our current task right now is to um, is to try to fill fiscal year 23. Um, so by having better expense estimates, um, income estimates, um, we're also uh, beginning to do some analysis so that we can um, look at the next uh, collective bargaining agreements, which I will say right now will not include any market adjustments. I think we've made um, pretty significant ones based on studies and comparables that we've done. Um, so these will be, um, I think these numbers are more are mere, more realistic that are in, that are in here. So that's the budget forecast. Um, there's other tabs that dive into into health insurance. So um, these are these wonderful spreadsheets that Stacy builds, where I can just keep changing this number from five back down to three, and then back up to five again to see what the impacts are. Um, these are the state aid numbers. This is the lat of the current year Cherry uh, Cherry Street. This is the governor's budget proposal. And then of course, there's a couple of more versions. There's three more versions of um, budget proposals that we'll get the House Ways and Means, the Senate Ways and Means, and then the conference committee. Um, and we do often expect that these numbers will change hopefully in the upward direction. Um, local receipts. Um, so Stacy, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, you actually don't all vote on these individual numbers. You kind of vote on the bottom line number. Um, so these numbers do um, do shift quite a bit. This is the big number that we're um, that we're keeping an eye on that Stacy mentioned before: motor vehicle excise tax. Yeah, we don't actually vote revenues. We just need to know that we have a tied out budget, and when the recap comes, we'll tie it all out. Yeah, and the big um, the big increase here is trash disposal service. So this is the new um, the new rates that are embedded in this one point seven number. All right, I know that was that was quite a bit, but any questions for Stacy or myself? Thanks, Lisa. I know that um, a lot of us just uh, got the budget earlier tonight, so may have some questions in the coming weeks too. Um, and maybe Stacy can answer this question: um, How does this fare um, for our um, kind of three-year model? Um, for the operating uh, reserve percentage that, you know, uh, in our operating reserve policy? Well, at the end of just with the FY21 into FY22, it looks like I've done just a quick analysis of what the operating reserve would be. And at the end of 21, it's probably about 9%. But then if, if we take the projection numbers from the forecast right now, it tanks because we've got the 3 million, the 1.4 million, the 3 million and the 5 million. That's not completely tied out yet. So obviously there's still more work to close those gaps or by like 24, hold on, let me, um, I'm just gonna open up the last reserve that I did. But as we, if we can't tie out the gap, obviously we're going to be using reserves to balance the budget. So it's it's down in the fours after like 24, I think. But that's only because right now the forecast doesn't have some. I think it just needs some massaging and some tightening to see where we really land at the end of each year. <clears throat> so um, we, our policy is, is six to ten percent, right? So. Yep. Um, can I share the screen or is that? That's my version and you can share yours. 
Oh yeah, I'm just gonna see if we can see this. Oh, um, <clears throat> I think you need to share me as the host, or I can email it to you, Lisa, if you like. No, nope. um, you can share now. Yeah, I okay. just made you as a co-host. Thanks, Patty. <laughs> All right, let me just find the right one. All right, can you see it's um, called the operating reserves forecast? Can you see that? All right. Yes. Um, so all, all I do, and this is something that FinCom uses and uh, we've used in the past, where we pretty much start with the undesignated fund balance, which is the, um, basically, it's not free cash, but it's what we have for net income from the previous fiscal year. And then um, since we voted items at fall town meeting, we take those off the top because we voted some free cash usage at the fall town meeting. Obviously a big chunk of that was COVID related. Um, and then in the spring, we usually do a bunch of money for snow and ice. And there's usually other items we use free cash for. So as you can see, I've taken that million dollars and sort of stretched it out because in the springtime that's where we're like catching up especially for snow and ice and then some oddball items and so that's what we're estimating to propose um it says f uh 2020 but i mean if uh s spring coming 2021 and then in the budget right now we've proposed that hundred thousand dollars to be used from free cash it's the the lance capital maintenance um deferred maintenance that we've set aside using free cash every year and um, as you scroll down, other operational needs. So right now we had, I think, $876,000 of COVID needs for FY22. So I just plunked $900,000 in there because I'm not sure how good the 876 is if the Board of Health needs to true up any of their numbers, but um, that's probably a good request for, for um, free cash usage. And so as we get down to the, the end, we're looking at 9.28% in FY21. So that's with using our estimated revenues that we have currently right now. As we get to the future years, I'm sorry if, uh, if can you still see it okay? Um, we take out the same 500. We might want to take out or estimate some to take out in the uh, fall town meeting. But I didn't have to do much to see how this is declining because I'm using the revenues that's from the projection and I'm filling the gap with free cash. So hopefully this gap of 1.4 million can be reduced so that we're not tanking our reserves as we go along into FY23, actually. So FY24, we're down to 1%. But again, that's because we haven't really balanced those out years. And if it's going to take reserves to balance, then we're going to need an override, obviously. So this oh. right here is only assuming that we're going to turn back or replenish our reserves with 800,000, but we've, we've had higher, um, we've had higher than that. So that's pretty conservative. Uh, Stacy, I, I thought uh, that the 1.4 was an FY23, not an FY22. Well, we use FY22's reserve to fund FY23. Oh, we I have see. To okay. We have Got to it. reserve it at the end of the year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's pretty much gone. So that's why I've got, um, I don't have anything other than the hundred thousand dollars for reserves for FY twenty two because we haven't chosen to use anything other than what we might fund for COVID. Yeah. So. If uh, I yeah. Um, so let me, if I can, just go back to the uh, budget uh, overview here. Um, I didn't see a reserve uh, for overlay. We usually reserve around four hundred thousand. Yeah, that should be in there. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna close this so I can uh, so you can show that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Oops. It's uh, actually it's right here. So it's four fifty six. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, I guess I was looking at line sixty uh, row sixty six. For some reason, there's FB reserve for overlay there. Oh, that's on the revenue side. Never mind. Oh, that's fund balance. If we had yeah. any overlay that we close, um, if we um, released any overlay and we used it. Okay, got it. Okay, yeah. Um, so, uh, Stacy, what you, so or both of you? I mean, what we're looking at is possibly an FY twenty four or FY twenty five override, assuming that 
you know, next year it's not going to be 1.4 million, assuming that things can get adjusted, right? So, I mean, I think, you know, in FY20, we passed it, Nova ride for two years and making it last four or five years, right? So there's, I, I know that saying override is never a popular thing, but I think we have to keep in mind that, um, you know, this budget is making it last a lot longer than, than it was originally intended for. So um, I think everybody's doing a, a good job here. Yeah, it sort of depends how much we can squeeze the 1.4 and then the 3 million down. I, I think there's a lot more analysis that can be done. And I think there's just flat 3% for all the departments. And like Lisa said, it's 5% for the schools, 4% for their expenses. Those might be kind of high. Um, but then again, we've got contracts coming, FY23, 24, and 25 to settle. Yeah, yeah well, and health insurance is flat 5%. And as we know, it can be two it could be eight right so uh that can blow the whole budget so yeah i mean yeah it's so sensitive when you have a one percent swing that's a million bucks you know so it's it's tough yeah i mean that's how we got 10 years without an override before it was six straight years of zero to one percent on on health right so yeah which is unheard of but you know lucky yeah. us <laughs> yeah i thought we were going to get something lower than what they came up with. I was really kind of depressed about that. <laughs> I mean, considering I we're still in the middle, considering we're that? still in the middle of a global pandemic, I think yeah. the fact that we're not at eight percent is uh, is okay. Who knows what will happen with the Affordable Care Act now that Biden's in office too? There might be more fees because right now I think one of the one of the components of our rate increase is probably a 2% fee for the ACA. So no matter what, how great our um, history is and our claim activity is, I think no matter what, it would be 2%. Am I right? I think it was two or 2.3 lease, or I forget what he was saying, but um, that all goes into the bucket to help subs uh, subsidize insurance across the country. So I will say, I mean, the budget is very sensitive to a lot of things and that's why it's kind of a, a a major guess. So for example, um, I just took school salaries and um, made that 4% and then added $100,000 um, from uh, to local aid. And, you know, the 1.4 goes down to 800,000. Um, I mean, you, you never know, right? So there's just any of these variables. Um, I don't know if Nick's still on the phone, but one of the things that we talked about, uh, you know, right here, for example, the the enterprise subsidy. Um, I don't know why that's one fifty. That should be actually that should go back to one seventy five. Um, but even here, right? I mean, this is a this is um, having the subsidy that we've been giving him for the last two years, assuming that um, you know they're going to be able to resume full programming again. But we're um we're starting we're starting fiscal year twenty three, um we're starting that work tomorrow actually. Lisa, on the um, uh, transportation side, I know that we talked a lot about um, uh, and it's kind of shifting money around. But um, with the rec department, um, you know that's obviously struggled um, you know more than really any of our departments uh, uh, over the past year um, and kind of adding to that saying, all right, you also have to uh, fund your transportation costs. I mean, certainly that's something that the, the town should help with. Um, and um, do we kind of see those numbers um, that that subsidy kind of continuing for a while or? Um, I know we're talking with Nick about what exactly those transportation costs would be, um, what the potential impact would be in terms of revenue um, or, or, or uh, you know, expenses that he would pass on in terms of programming. But um, at least for this year, he had actually created a budget with just the $175,000 revenue. Um, we increased it to 350 as a buffer. Um, so we can certainly, um, you know, try to see what that potential transportation impact would be this first year with us um, helping and supporting that and then uh, making decisions on what we can put in for future years. 
but did I he budget the um, transportation in the budget with the 350 or is that is that out of the budget? So I actually, I haven't seen his final budget yet, um, but last week he had said he was building something around the 175. So I said, I'll, I'll give you the 350 to make sure that you've got enough for the buffer, the transportation, and then, um, you know, potentially unemployment and the other costs that we talked about <laughs> throwing his way. How much do we anticipate the transportation costs um, being for him? Uh, a couple hundred thousand. A couple hundred thousand. Yeah. And um, would, would that uh, would those costs be shared by any other um, departments or groups? Um, that's part of the discussion is, is whether there would be um, a fee for busing, whether the schools can um, can subsidize some of it and also if that busing goes to other programs around town, um, whether the costs are shared. So that's all. Those are all questions that I think Nick can better answer. Are there other comments or questions? This looks really good and I know as a a lot of work and that it's um you know not just doing one year but you know projecting out so um thank you yeah it's hard to you know not have concerns you know looking at the um budget just a year out from where we are and uh deficits and our um reserve policy i mean and uh needing an operate operating override um you know i'm guessing uh planning one for um calendar year 23 um that, i don't know if that's what we're we're looking for um but certainly it's a conversation that we need to have and i don't know if the, if we've kind of evaluated um you know while we're adding positions um kind of if there's um uh, any way that um, we're not filling others uh, rather than than cutting but uh, you know, typically you kind of do that in advance of uh, known deficits. So um, I don't know if there's, you know, uh, in, in departments, we've got positions that have been there for a while. Maybe we don't need them anymore or that we can kind of change them or shift them in a way for cost savings. I don't know if we've kind of done that um, or asked the departments to do that. Um, we have had some delays in hiring. I know in the, uh, the fire department, because the vacancies are so low, um, that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, that's one of the reasons why we pushed off the part-time dispatch. That saves about forty thousand dollars in um, in the budget. Um, I know the the police department has some retirements that we've been talking about whether um, we need to push those off. So, for example, um, there might be at some point a retirement in the detective unit, but um, given the amount of work, they've actually been. Um, looking to increase their resources. So these are all kinds of operational decisions that um, we'll make on a case by case basis. Okay. But I think uh, Mike, Mike, one of the, the suggestions that you've had early on is um, looking at the, the two new positions in particular is challenging us, challenging us to find revenue sources. Um, so I will say that there is um, a pipeline of potential um, resources that we can use for both of those positions, whether it be looking at um, a surcharge or it's looking at some of the um, the pharmaceutical uh, settlement money coming down the road, um, whether it's uh, you know creatively creatively looking at the pilot program with the hospital. Um, so those are in the works as well. Thanks. Uh, the um... Yeah, thank you. I don't know if there are other um, questions from um, board members. Anyone else? Stacey, I didn't know if you had any other um, comments. Just a quick question. Do we have a budget summit meeting tomorrow? Is that tomorrow? Yeah, OK. You at two. You can oh, two, OK. <laughs> we'll talk yeah. about the, reserve, the operating reserve. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, the, based on what I have, it doesn't look good, but 
there is some tightening we need to do. The but yeah, I mean, just with like new positions, like you mentioned, if we just have to consider the benefits piece of it too and the impact. Mm -hmm. we, we buffer some new positions and new uh, people jumping onto the plan during the year and then people shifting from the active plan to the retiree plan. But when we do have new positions, we need to add those into Medicare, unemployment, um, not so much unemployment, Medicare, pension, um, and health insurance, definitely. Have we um, done any incentives for um, families to encourage them? Um, I, I know that we kind of, we did the focus plan last um, uh, time around, um, but encouraging families to use kind of uh, other um, insurance of their um, partners or anything like that? Nothing yet. I think I, I have that in my contract, but I'm the only one who has that because out of everyone, I think Lisa, myself, and maybe Mark are the only ones that actually have a contract. Um, but I'm the only one that gets paid a certain amount of money for not being on our plan, which saves the town probably $15,000 um, jumping on my husband's plan. But Communities do do that. It's just a matter of designing a program so that not everybody jumps off the plan at once. They have to have certain, they have to be on the plan for a little while. There's, there's all sorts of things to look at because though everybody else that's been off the plan for so long, they obviously are going to want the benefit too because they're not on the plan as well. So it's, it gets a little tricky with how to implement it. it it's, it's hard because it's been uh, kind of a policy priority of the, the board to not reduce the quality of our insurance as well. And you see a lot of communities over a period of time just kind of chipping away um, at those benefits and shifting more of the cost to the employees. And, um, you know, when I, I think a few years ago, we had a 10% increase. Um, and, you know, it, it forces plan changes um, when you don't have a uh, million dollars kicking around uh, in the operating budget, right? So, I mean, if we got that next year, you know, it would have to come from somewhere. And, we don't want it to come out of uh, the pockets of our employees, which is what ends up happening. So, um, so anyways, just just something to consider. The other question I had too, on the um, mental health clinician, are um, have, have we considered that uh, being a part of the health department, or is that specifically something that's in the police department lane? It just it just feels weird to be on the police side. Yeah, actually, that was. Um... I'm trying to remember the full discussion, but it was actually presented at a board of health meeting uh, by Dot Butler and um, Dan Peranek. So both of them discuss it. So it does seem like a um, like a good fit for either department. Um, I think Dan uh, was really the one that took the lead in terms of um, researching, um, looking at comparable communities and positions, and the the ones that came up most often were ones that were embedded within the police department. And I think that's why um, we have that model moving forward. Yeah. Not that the health department needs any more to do right now. Just, um, you know, but um, just, just a question I had, Susan, did you have something to say? I was just going to say that I, there, there are comparable communities where this um, type of position um, exists and you know, I can imagine the, the person kind of being pulled in various directions and it's gonna, it's gonna be interesting, but um, it, you know, it, this, this is something that other, not just urban areas, but other towns are starting to do. Yeah, I mean, I guess the question to me is, is this person going to respond to emergency issues of mental health or is it going to be like uh, scheduled issues, right? That would also, affect what department they are in because emergency calls go into the police department, not the health department. Yeah, there, there's both. Um, so in, in talking with the police, they are often made aware of um, a lot of issues that um, there really is no obvious police intervention. Um, so in terms of any issues that, that might arise, uh, where they get calls or they're, you know, part of a, a coalition or get information, uh, they will often get that information before the health department or the health department not, not even get that information. That's one of the reasons why we thought it would be good to embed this person here because then they actually have somebody who can intervene early and prevent any official, you know, police involvement down the road.
All right. Um, great. Anything else from anyone? Sorry to um, keep you around, Stacy. Um, but uh, that's okay. I was posting journal entries while listening. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like fun. Um, you know, it, it kind of in context of that too, Stacy. I don't know. I know your department has been just kind of inundated in the past really couple of years, but certainly in the last year. Um, is there uh, staff support in your office that we need to address in the budget or? Um, well, I, I didn't ask for it this year, just to, to follow the budget message. Last year I asked for a position um, and due to COVID it got sliced, but I mean, understandably so. And this year I didn't ask for it just because of um, the level service budget message. Um, yeah, we, we're always, we're always working a million hours extra. We could use another professional technical like accountant to help with all of the overload. But um, this year, especially, um, I was gonna bring this to your attention, probably the next meeting, just about my vacation carry forward. I have, a, um, I have someone on, who's gonna be on leave for 12 weeks and it's really gonna cripple the department and, um, we got to figure out a way to manage between the three of us. And then we've got vacation carry forwards. I'm going to go to FinCom, I think tomorrow night to request one person in my office has a ton of time. There's no way she's going to be able to take it and then have somebody else be on leave for 12 weeks. So it's just tough right now. It's a little tough, but um, we'll figure out the semantics of the, of the new position with some restructuring and hopefully for like the FY23 budget. Um, hopefully even a part-time position, would that be, you know, is um, that less helpful or? It might be a little unhelpful at the moment just because oh. I've got to scramble and figure out how I'm going to, um, unfortunately the position that's going to be on leave is like, it's a high level position and there's not a lot of governmental support out there that um, you can just have someone jump right in. So I, I am kind of reaching out to some of my consulting friends if they can come in for a couple of days, but I'm also trying to work out with the staff member, like coming in at least once a week to help. So that would make life so much easier, um, but we'll see. I'll, 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 um, I'll keep you all informed, see if I'm sinking. <laughs> yeah, it just seems like it's been a lot of hours, a lot of um, staff, um, you know, over time and uh, kind of, uh, yeah, and I mean, how we deal time. with overtime, because I don't have an overtime budget, um, is like giving comp time. So that's yeah. part of my request for FinCom tomorrow night is to get some overtime so that I can't keep granting time off to people because they just can't, we just can't take it. And I mean, I know there's other department heads that just can't seem to take all their vacation either. If, if for whatever reason they've had a carry forward, it's really difficult to take the carry forward and the current year all in one year and throw COVID in the mix, it just like disrupts everything. And we had, you know, the CARES Act, FEMA, insurance insurance credits were ridiculous. The insurance companies should have handled their own credits through their own administration, but they throw it at us to issue credits for people that were in a plan back in April. We've got all new school teachers coming on board. So we had to really reconcile and figure out who deserves the credits, how are we gonna process it? We got one for April, we got one for November, we got another dental one for November. So it's just, and then retirees as well. Mass teachers won't process the credit through deduction. So now we have to process 700 um, uh, counts payable, uh, not 700, sorry, it's only the mass teachers, but it's just like all this extra COVID stuff. We just don't have it in our schedule to deal with. But um, like, you know, the Board of Health, I'm sure they're swimming and other DPW swimming, just this, the whole COVID thing makes it tough. But we'll manage, hopefully. Great. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, thank you, guys. Have a good rest out. of the meeting. <laughs> thank you, Stacy. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so we'll move uh, down to the um, number eight um, on our agenda. The uh, Morocco Culvert and Morocco School uh, immediate repair override. I think it was our our intention to um, vote the question tonight. I don't know if there's um, anyone that had uh, anything they wanted to address with that or any any concerns. We do have uh, informational sessions that we're starting um, uh, on a regular basis when uh, this 
Thursday at 6.30. I forget, Susan, what time is it? Is it? Uh, I should know that. I know. We both should know it, but it's it's just, it all blends together. But 6.30 p.m. on Thursday. 6.30 p.m. Thursday. Yeah. Thanks, Mariana. Yeah, I mean, I think my, I mentioned this in the joint committee with the school committee, this joint meeting with the school committee. Um, so first of all, in terms of the Morocco repairs, I think they're absolutely critical. And I think that those students and teachers and families deserve a school that's in working order where they can actually learn and, um, and grow and develop. So my, my biggest concern is the, the coupling of the two projects in a humongous override right now at a time where people are struggling, there's a lot of families that are struggling. And that's a lot, that's the, the biggest override I've seen. Um, and I know it's a debt exclusion override, so it's a different than an operating. But my concern is the timing. And um, so my question would be, and this is the same question I had during the joint meeting, is is there a way to, to decouple those two um, and look to delay the Morocco culvert project for at least a year till we're out of the co till we're out of COVID and people feel like they can breathe again. Um, so that's my biggest concern is really the timing. And I think it's it's un I'm uncomfortable with having the citizens of Winchester vote on a $12.7 million override this year. So that's that's my biggest concern. I don't know what the answer to those questions are. Well, um, I, I, I think you know I, I think it's important um, question and you know kind of why we do things in um kind of a certain order so we're going to be looking for a lynch override um in 22 i think december of 22 um actually and then immediately after um sounds like an operating um override what happens um with a lot of these larger construction projects is they they increase in cost over a very short period of time so if we wait um two years on the culvert, um, the projected cost increases are a million dollars. So, um, and if we, you know, had done it a couple years ago, we would have saved a million dollars. And so, um, you know, we, uh, we, we plan these things uh, in, in a way that uh, really benefits the residents uh, health and safety. And so uh, we were um, really, this, this is kind of, um, along the lines of uh, our plans when we started the flood mitigation program, we always knew that this was going to be the last one um, at the end. And it's not really effective and doesn't completely come into fruition uh, until we're able to to really complete um, the job that we started um, years ago, maybe, maybe even 20 years ago, Susan, you can correct me. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I think um, Residents have already have always supported and have recently supported, uh, you know, a lot of our work on the flood mitigation plan. Um, you know, we did the large project skillings. We have Swanton Street lined up, and uh, the the more uh, um, more time, um, the more money. And so, um, it's you know, the more we kick kick the can down the road, um, the harder you know it gets, and the less benefit we have. And it's also you look at a really a, a four year timeline from the beginning until the completion of it. So it also pushes off a potential um, Morocco school rebuild project um, the longer that we, we wait. So uh, there's a ton of permitting that has to go on with these projects and uh, a, a lot of engineering. So um, the more complicated they get, and this, this is the um, one of the more complicated ones. So. You know, I mean, I understand all of the project implications and I think both projects obviously need to get done. I'm not disputing that at all. I just think that we also, I feel very strongly that we also have to think about the families and their their wallets and what they're having to do in really hard times. And so on its face, and again, I believe both of these projects are incredibly important and we, we need to do them, but on its face, it's very uncomfortable. And I just, I think, First of all, I don't know why we have to vote on this before we have public meetings to hear from residents. I mean, I think I'd feel more comfortable if I actually was able to hear some of the feedback from the public about this before we vote as a board. I don't know if there's a protocol there, but um, that would be something that I would probably want to talk about as well. And I'm not trying to delay this, but I just I, I feel pretty strongly about it. And I 
I want to talk about what the options are, you know, instead of just pushing this forward. Uh, so the flood mitigation program, in my view, the flood mitigation program that the, the town has taken over the last couple of decades has been in the tens of millions of dollars. And we've done, uh, what is it, eight out of 10 projects. And we have two left. Uh, it's the Swanton Street Bridge and the Morocco Culvert. And um, the all the other projects were funded, are done, they've benefited all the residents who are downstream um, and the residents who are upstream of Morocco have paid for all those debt exclusion overrides and they have not received the benefits of it because we haven't finished it yet. Because until that culvert is expanded um, at the railroad track behind Morocco, the water is still pooling behind and putting all those properties at risk of flooding the properties that are upstream. Um, so given that we've done eight out of 10 projects and the ninth is already funded, to me, it's a question of equity that we need to approve this project now um, in order to finish the flood mitigation program that we started and all of the residents of Winchester get to um, get to see the benefits of the flood mitigation that all the residents have paid for. I, I just, I can't, you know, I can't see saying no to the residents who've, who live upstream of the Morocco culvert saying you've paid for the other nine, but now we're going to delay um, the, um, the, the, the one last project that benefits everybody. So um, I, I'm definitely in favor of uh, putting this um, on the ballot. Yeah, I would just say that, you know, I, I understand your concern, um, Amy, and yes, <laughs> this is the middle of a pandemic and the economic fallout from it. Um, that said, um, people have been waiting for 20 years um, on this culvert and getting the whole thing finished. Um, I think you don't notice when the flooding is absent um, and you think you don't really realize what the need is. But in 2010, as late as 2010, there was really catastrophic flooding. And um, it occurred to me that we you know, could look into you know, whether we've had a similar level of rainfall in the period since 2010, like maybe what we've done, you know, so far will kind of hold us for a little bit longer. But in fact, um, the storms in 2010 were like a 25 year storm is in the one in the one month in the month of March, we had two major storms. And um, according to the town's records and, and Beth verified with um, BHB, the engineer that uh, designed all the flood mitigation projects. Um, there really hasn't been that level of rainfall. We haven't had that kind of a storm um, in the years since. So the, the risk is really out there. It really exists. And, um, you know, there, there, and then there are all the other reasons, like all of these costs will go up with um, the passage of time. And, you know, the, it, it's not like the, thing, the whole program got built according to the timetable that was originally envisioned, it, it did get stretched out a lot. Um, so the cost did go up. And um, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I think we just need to um, put this before the voters. And, you know, as has been said, it's not gonna hit immediately. And, you know, we just, we just don't wanna hold it up any further. So I'm, I'm in support of, of doing this to, at this time. And what we'd be voting on tonight is to put it on the ballot. Is that correct? Yeah. So, I mean, residents will be able to decide whether or not, you know, this is a project they support at the ballot. I mean, it's uh, um, and probably in the last 20 years, more than anything, I think we've been in regular communication um, with town about the 
flood mitigation. So um, it's um, it, it's out there. Um, I, I think the um, it, information sessions um, are there to answer questions, but I think we've had strong signals from the community um, for numerous years, as Mariano was saying, that uh, that this is a priority and um, we're, um, we're, we're lucky really that we're at the very end um, of the project that we can close this out and deliver those results to uh, protect the neighborhood and the community. And um, uh, so, um, you know, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's really our obligation at this point um, to, to, to put it in front of the voters and to encourage people to support it. And uh, again, the, um, it, it may seem like it's a large um, override for um, that, that we're putting together for the culvert and the immediate repairs. But, uh, you know, we, we knew we had two aging schools with Lynch and Morocco, and we were putting uh, out uh, requests for both of them to be rebuilt. And um, we were only going to get one at a time. So, um, you know, it's we've had a lot of uh, deferred uh, capital improvements to the projects, and we've had some surprises like these boilers that come up. But, um, you know, it's... Um, uh, I think that the Morocco school needs more repairs than this, um, uh, frankly. Um, and um, uh, I don't feel great about the making the override um, less than it needs to be for um, kids and families that uh, benefit from that school. Um, hopefully uh, doing that project now um, will extend the life of the building um, so we can, uh, it, 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 we're talking about uh, keeping a roof on the school and we're talking about getting heat in the school. So it's not, uh, we're not gilding the lily here. This is a, uh, um, the, the Morocco culvert project and the Morocco school repairs are absolutely the most necessary, um, projects that are in front of the board. Um, so, um, I, I, I hope we can support it. And I think it's, uh, um, I hope we can support it unanimously as well. And, um, so one thing is from a number standpoint, I mean, I know the number looks big compared to the operating override, but if we're paying for debt service, right? This is a debt exclusion, so it's less than a million dollars a year, right? So it's not like the operating override was 10 million, that was 10 million a year. This is 12.7 over 25 years, right? So it's- Yeah, so, so the, it, and I can kind of- and, yeah. the, and, the, and the question's not, by the way, the question's not gonna have that number because it's a debt exclusion is, is to do the, the debt service for the necessary project, right? And then town meeting will appropriate how much the necessary project is. So if we look at like the McCall um, phase two, that was around $10.2 million override or debt exclusion that passed. And the debt service on that is around uh, $600,000, right? So that's, you know, we're not talking about a 12.7 as, you know, like the 10 million operating override and and you know right. we're, we're going to be um we actually yeah. have to wait a year before we start servicing debt you know um on uh the those projects and so um it is going to be pushed out a little bit um further but the the other piece of it is that um for the culvert project which is the largest portion of it um we are going to take that out um you know more years we can't really do that with the school repairs because uh they're they're you know um you know, it's like, um, you know, leasing a car, you can't spread the payments out, you know, over 40 years, because you know, you probably only get to have it for a shorter period of time. So anyway, it's uh, so the, the repairs are going to be a, a shorter funding mechanism. And the uh, the culvert's going to be a little bit longer. So um, it's a good, good combination. Um, yeah, I mean, I will say that I think that there's an assumption because you all have been doing this a lot longer than I have. But I think that there's there's an assumption that a lot of people in town understand this and are waiting for this. And there, there's there's a lot of people that are not as familiar with overrides and what goes into it and the difference between an operating override and a debt exclusion override. And I've explained that to many of my friends who have asked me that question. And I, I hardly understand it, but I've been able to learn up, learn up about it. But I think that for me, it's just let's if I'm I'm absolutely comfortable putting this in front of the voters. I mean, that's that's what should happen. They should make the final decision. I just think that if the if we can as a board just commit to being transparent and being very um, intentional about the education around it, and that, like you said, Mariano, that's a big that's a twelve point seven is a big nut to crack. But if you break it down and you explain what that actually means, I think that that's that's how we're going to get support of this from a more 
a more broad part of Winchester. So that's, yes. I mean, I think there, there's an education piece of it that I think needs to happen. And I'm certainly willing to support that and help with that. Um, but I just wanted to put that out there because it's not as clear cut to some. Yeah. So what we usually do for a debt exclusion is we take what the, um, the debt service is going to cost per year. And then we say for a million dollar house, this is going to be the increase per year. Right. And we do the same for the operating override, like for the 10 million, this is how much. So it's going to be a lot, that number, the, it's going to cost this much per year. It's going to be a lot less than the operating override. And that's usually what helps people compare whether it's operating or debt exclusion, it doesn't matter. It's how much is it going to cost me per year in taxes, right? Absolutely. So yeah. that's the number. That so we will have that number. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's really important. We've been sort of immersed in this and and didn't articulate that um, very well. So I'm glad I'm glad Mariano brought that up and explained it. So I'll go ahead and make a motion. Um, I move that the a proposition two and a half debt exclusion override question be put on the ballot for the March 30th, 2021 annual town election as follows. Shall the town of Winchester be allowed to exempt from the provisions of proposition two and one half so called the amounts required to pay for the bonds issued in order to install additional culverts behind Morocco elementary school for flood mitigation purposes and to make extraordinary repairs to the Morocco Elementary School, including engineering expenses and all other costs in incidental and related thereto. Second. All in favor, I'll take a roll call vote. Susan? Yes. Mariano? Yes. Amy? Yes. And yes for me, motion carries unanimously, four to zero. Thank you, everyone. And um, as I said, we will have a information sessions um, uh, regularly um, between now uh, and uh, the end of March uh, when it will be on the ballot and uh, first one starting uh, this Thursday at 630. So um, please come on and uh, come all. Um, we'll, we'll be there and uh, uh, Beth Rudolph and uh, uh, the town engineer and Chris Nixon school side and uh, staff have been working on a, a, a presentation there that kind of explains uh, not only the individual projects, but the debt service, the cost of waiting, um, and, uh, and and some more details about it. So um, looking forward to it. Um, thank you to the board uh, for the support there. Um, uh, next up, the um, number nine, the uh, Lynch Elementary School Feasibility Study Agreement. Um, I don't have that in front of me, but I think um, we just need to um, vote to approve. Yeah. yeah the, um, and there's there's the, prescribed yeah. language. Yeah, I think I, I okay. think we have that. Um, so I move that the select board authorize the town manager to execute and take all other ac actions necessary to enter into the feasibility study agreement with the Massachusetts School Building Authority for the Lynch Elementary School. Second. Uh, all in favor, I'll take a roll call vote, Susan. Yes. Mariano. Yes. Amy. Yes. And yes for me, motion carries unanimously four to zero. See, that one was easy. Yeah, and I wasn't sure that was the right language because I, I remember in other um, building um, projects, the MSBA had this long set of sort of like waivers or like we, we recognize we're not going to get the money yet and we recognize that this is contingent on a lot of things and they, maybe they changed their language so i'm glad they did um okay so uh the covid testing update um i don't i know that um at least i don't know if you if you had an update on that one or if um uh i think jen had submitted something Yes, yeah, so the, um, the health department is uh, actually submitting a request for um, COVID testing, uh, PCR testing for the remainder of the year, as well as uh, vaccine uh, clinics. Make sure I have the right phone. Um, 
Um, so this is their, um, this is the revised request for uh, the testing program. Um, so Stacy had mentioned a $51,000 uh, reserve fund transfer in December. Uh, we haven't used that yet. So um, Jen is lumping that into her program here. Um, so she's looking for 175,000. The, the actual cost is 270, uh, but she's looking at a CARES contribution of 45,000 and then using the previous RFT. Um, so she sent this just before the meeting. Uh, I, I have a potential um, potential issue of using this 51,000 because the contingency um, or the conditions of this 51,000 was that we charge. And I don't think that um, Jen is looking to charge for some of this other testing. So that's a clarification that um, I need to make with Jen before uh, the finance committee meeting tomorrow. And then she's also requesting another 100,000 for vaccine clinics. So right now, um, they're working on um, in-home visits for elderly or the vaccines. Um, Jen is putting together a vaccine clinic later on this month for ages 75 plus. Um, they're also helping with seniors that are calling to place them in um, earlier appointments and other state funded sites. And uh, um, in terms of future vaccine clinics, it's all really dependent on how many vaccines we get and how that timing corresponds to um, the different phases of uh, of when we can actually add additional people to um, to get test to get the vaccine. And we've carved out that hundred thousand dollar request for the reserve fund transfer. Um, I think right because um, I think the uh, DOR had indicated to us that we can kind of deficit spend um, on that line item. So are you, are we looking to authorize you to um, ask for this reserve fund transfer for this amount or up to this amount or? What, what um, so <laughs> I would actually um, get support for the original amount without the 51,000. And I would just have those up to at this point in time. So what's the amount? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I, do you need our, I don't, I don't think you need a vote from us, oh. right? Um, not really, because the, the, the one in December is, the, um, I, I actually was the one that put that in yeah. on behalf of Jen, because she was very, very busy that month. Um, but this one she's putting in. Um, but we are, we're kind of doing this with her. We, we're supporting this effort. So I guess we could just, uh, you know, uh, vote to support the reserve fund uh, transfer request by the um, health department um, for COVID and vaccine testing. Yeah, for February um, to June. Yeah, February to June. So, so moved. Yeah. Okay. Second. Uh, all in favor, um, I'll take a roll call vote. Susan? Yes. Amy? Yes. Mariana? Yes. And yes for me, motion carries unanimously four to zero. So it, it's helpful when we go to FinCom and we can share that it has the full support of the select board, especially that it's, it's coming from Jen and the health department. So thank you. Um, okay, uh, the eviction moratorium update. I'm not sure we landed on that. That we were hopefully trying to move that through um, the health department. I don't know if they, they took it up or not yet, so. Um, they're, they're actually going to talk about it on Thursday. So I guess the question is, do we want them to go first or do we want to go first? We, um, they were not able to talk about it. So I haven't gotten the input from them. So potentially I could get input from them and a potential vote on Thursday and then bring it back to this board on the 22nd. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that there's probably consensus of the select board that this is something that um, we would support. But I think where we landed last time was that um, it, it makes sense that the health department who has kind of more authority, um, you know, over something like this is the one that makes the first decision. And it's kind of where we were, um, in the beginning of the pandemic, figuring out who is going to, um, 
do these things that need to be done. And, um, you know, there's, there's a concern for us with an eviction moratorium. If, if we vote it and it's not supported by law, that tenants will have a false sense of security and um, make decisions based on that. So, um, um, so anyway, um, so maybe, maybe we, um, we signal support unless there's any questions and um, seems like there's consensus um, seeing nods. And I think that we had that from our last meeting. So um, we'll, we'll wait to approve it for the next, uh, our next meeting. That sounds good. Um, okay. And sorry, Lisa, I didn't even get uh, back to uh, your report and there's a uh, uh, appointment as well. Um, so I'll start with the appointment in accordance with section 4-2B of the town charter. I've made the following full-time promotional appointment in the Department of Public Works Maintenance Department to Paul Meany to working foreman. And I respectfully request the board vote to waive the usual 15 day appointment period. So I move that we waive the 15 day appointment period for the DPW promotional appointment of Paul Meany. Second. All in favor, I'll take a roll call vote, Susan. Yes. Amy? Yes. Mariana? Yes. And yes for me. Motion carries unanimously four to zero. Um, All right, I'm going to move this quickly because we actually already covered a lot of this. Um, so we've got the information session for the Morocco flood mitigation and culvert project in school on February 11th at 6.30 p.m. Um, the health department is organizing a vaccine clinic in late February for ages 75 plus. Um, the state hotline is available Monday through Friday. It's 211. Um, this is the reserve fund transfer that we just talked about. Um, so I have selected um, the interim police chief, Dan O'Connell, to be the next police chief. We're working on the paperwork right now, and we'll bring that back to the board for February 22nd. Um, the MBTA just emailed me their latest schedule this morning. They're mobilizing this week. They're going to start abatement next week and then start the major work on February 22nd. Um, they're anticipating that that heavy demolition period is actually going to be 10 weeks. Um, this is different than the license agreement granted by the board that is eight weeks starting on uh, the, the 15th. Um, so this extends it by at least um, three weeks beyond then. Um, so I did talk with the project manager about coming back to the select board for an extension. Um, there is a provision in the license agreement that says that we won't reasonably withhold any extensions they might be ready to come to the, the meeting on the 22nd. They might not, um, I will let you know. Uh, but they have set up a community meeting for Tuesday, February 23rd at 6 p.m. Um, folks can go to mbta.com slash Winchester Station to um, sign up. And then they've also established a hotline number for um, people to call. So they're not calling us all the time, <laughs> um, especially if they do some night work. So here's the number we're gonna make sure that's posted on our website. Um, economic development, the town um, uh, just got word that we um, are going to receive a technical assistance grant um, from DHCD. This is a local, uh, a grant to um, get a consultant and create a local rapid recovery planning program. So it's specifically gonna work with our town center businesses impacted by COVID. Um, helping small businesses. There's a variety of different activities that can qualify as part of this plan. Um, and then the next round is open for the microenterprise grant. They did make some changes. Um, so um, before businesses that started, they had to start um, January of 2019 and they've extended that so that if a, a business started up and up through October, 2019, they're now eligible to, to apply um, and then people can also start using 2020 taxes in addition to 2019. Um, this was a problem because a lot of folks did well in 2019, but then um, had major co uh, COVID impacts and actually did not do so well in 2020. They were not allowed to factor in their um, declining 2020 income, but now they can. And then the last one is just the um, MSB agreement that you just approved.
Great. Thanks, Lisa. Any questions? Okay. Um, Uh, we do have a vote yep. for the contract change. Oh, okay. What, what's the contract change? Um, it's under the Equity and Anti-Racism Task Force report. Um, Susan, I'm not sure if you saw my email with the, the vote. I line. did. Okay. Yeah, I did. This is just to stretch out the, um, the contract mainly. So I move that we extend the contract with FEMRA to May 31st. 2021 and increase the project amount to uh, increase the project amount to or by I by $2,400. Second. What, what is the, what's the um, subject of the, the extension? I'm sorry, when you say the subject of the extension, you mean, um, yeah, I just I hadn't uh, you seen what it was for, just you know for the board to discuss just what we're um, what we're extending. Oh, um, this is uh, Femra's um, contract to do um, a municipal assessment for, as part of the anti-racism um, project for the town. So they are um, uh, they're adding a lot more uh, stakeholder meetings to their process and extending the time period to do the, the final phase, which is to conduct the survey. Um, that survey was supposed to be conducted actually now. Um, and there was some discussion about moving that. Um, I think part of it is that everyone is, is just so busy right now that um, uh, there was discussion about that there wasn't full engagement into the project. Um, so adding meetings and extending the time to allow for that engagement will um, yield a better survey result. Thank you. Um, uh, it, it's been moved and seconded. Um, take a, a roll call vote. Um, Susan, all in favor? Yes. Uh, Amy? Yes. Mariana? Yes. And yes, for me, motion carries unanimously 4 to 0. And uh, we'll move down to the consent agenda. So I move that we accept the consent agenda. Second. Uh, all in favor, uh, I'll take a roll call vote. Susan? Yes. Amy? Yes. Mariana? Yes. And yes, for me, motion carries unanimously. Uh, just one clarification, Lisa, w we don't have to like, like say that we accept this grant, right? Saying that we voted it on the consent agenda is fine. Okay. Yes. Right. And nice job to whoever got that $50,000 grant, by the way. That's pretty nice. Yeah, actually, it's our, our state delegation. <clears throat> so, Rep. Dan, Senator Lewis. Yeah, we, we appreciate that too because it was uh, a, um, a, a tough year to be carving out um, some of these, and uh, they had to go back and fight for it in a supplemental. So, um, not not an, not an easy thing to do. So, we uh, certainly appreciate it. Yes. Yeah. Um. So okay. Did we, we would move that we um, adjourn to executive session um, to discuss the reputation, character, physical condition, or mental health rather than the professional competence of an individual. Second. And we field. will not return and to And we will not, re not to return to, yes. Open Unless session. you want to, Mariano, it's up to you. <laughs> I'm just making sure that everybody yeah, knows we're you. not returning. I don't think anybody's going to be waiting around for us, to be honest with you, um, at that point. Um, so uh, it's been moved and seconded. I'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Susan? Yes. Amy? Yes. And Mariano? Yes. And yes for me. Uh, motion carries unanimously 4 to 0. So we'll stay here, right? And uh, everybody else, is that what we're doing? Yes. Okay. We'll kick everybody else out. Yep. <laughs>